Everything you need is right in front of you, in front of you. When you learn to see good things come to you. All you have to do is stop and take a look around. Before you intervene, don't do anything, anything. Yeah, come to all your senses, they'll tell you everything. First, you got to learn to stop and take a look around. Take a look around Listen to the sound Why not take a whiff? you see much better If you use more than just your eyes Now you gotta take a step outside yeah. ooh, ooh, ooh. If you wanna know, wanna know what your soil is like And what is gonna grow First you got to learn To stop and take a look around to the ground Don't be scared of the dirt It isn't gonna hurt and If you're braver you can try the flavor Now just get a handful of your land mm -hmm. Give it a squeeze in your hand And then just check out the display If it stays together it's probably clay but if it falls apart, it's sad. Well, the point of that is all you gotta do is take a look, take a look, take a look. And read your landscape like a book. Interact, low impact, and get your feedback when you take a little look around. Well, abundance will abound. Because the problem is the solution. Just depends on your perception Gotta change yourself before you change the world Yeah, we gotta take a look around On the inside and out Cause when you observe yourself You see everything else Make good use of it now, yeah Uh, tonight in Bread Theory, we are going to be doing part nine of our Intro to Permaculture series. Let me just back up the video just one second here. Uh, right there. That's good. Oh, a little bit more. So we've been covering a bunch of stuff on permaculture. It is not wanting to go all the way back up. And we'll just put it there. Anyway, we've been covering a bunch of stuff on permaculture. Uh, we've gone through the basic luminaries in the field, the founders of it, uh, the, the three ethics of earth care, people care, and fair share, or return the surplus to the, the service of the first two ethics. We've gone through all the different principles. Observe and Interact was the, the one that you saw in the, the opening video right there. Uh, that was by Charlie McGee, who his, his band is called Formidable Vegetable Sound System. And he took all the, the 12 principles from uh, uh, the, the principles and uh, permaculture principles and pathways beyond sustainability 
Uh, he took each of those 12 principles and made them into a song track. So that was the, the first one, Observe and Interact, which is one of the, the permaculture principles, uh, according to David Holmgren, one of the co-founders of permaculture. So we've covered that. We've covered, uh, we, we, take, we took a look at a bunch of the course material for people that are going through what's known as a, a PDC, or a Permaculture Design Certificate course. Uh, we covered all sorts of things about reading the landscape, dealing with water, and just uh, working with nature instead of against it, basically. Uh, so we've gone through that, and, and we've gotten into some of the techniques of permaculture. Uh, we, we definitely have more of those in store for, for future shows. Uh, we've looked at uh, swales and berms on contour. We've looked at food forests. We've looked at a, a bunch of different techniques that permaculturists like to use in, in various situations. And, and uh, as I always like to point out, permaculture is always situational. It's, it's not a prescriptive sort of a design system. It's, it's one where you take the principles and the ethics and you apply them to the geography as you find it, including a city. You can, you can do this in a city as well. Uh, I, I do this in my own apartment. You can see right behind me there is a, a hibiscus tree that, that I got. It was a, um, you know, if you ever had hibiscus tea, that's, that's literally where it comes from is the flowers from the, the hibiscus uh, shrub. It usually grows as a shrub. By, by uh, pruning it in a certain way, you can get it to, to more of a, a tree-like shape. Um, but uh, I... I try and practice permaculture as much as I can in just my, my small apartment. Uh, I have tons of other plants growing in the living room as well, and as well as a window box, and which I plan to expand next year, and uh, a number of other things. Eventually, I want to have over, over my shoulder here uh, an entire aquaponics setup, uh, including a fish tank, which hopefully will be visible on camera, and uh, a number of grow beds, uh, so you can kind of see some more applied permaculture principles in action. Um, things like produce no waste and uh, use the, the marginal and, or, or use the edges and value the marginal, uh, things of that nature. So tonight we're going to continue on with uh, one of the great authors of permaculture. Um, who am I talking to? I'm talking to everyone who's uh, in the, the chat right now. So I guess that would be yourself, Apple Kid 3. Uh, as well as you, Blatt uh, J. Vig. Welcome to the, the show tonight. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to cover The Permaculture City by Toby Hemingway. He wrote a book, which I will bring up presently. Let me just get that on the screen right now. One second here. Let's minimize that. And... Put it. Oops. We'll put it right about there. So there you go. Uh, it's by Chelsea Green Publishing. Uh, there it is. You can see it. The Permaculture City, where he has tried to take permaculture principles and apply them to regenerating cities and making them more of a functional ecosystem. Uh, I haven't read it, but I, it's, it's definitely on my reading list. But this is the lecture that, that accompanies the book that we're going to be looking at. Um, so I, I'm really excited for this. It's going to incorporate a lot of the, the different things that, that I like to talk about between new urbanism and permaculture. Uh, probably not going to get from him as much leftist theory. I don't think he's necessarily opposed to it, but I just don't remember him ever talking about it. And Toby Hemingway, unfortunately, has, has passed on. Uh, he died at a, a relatively young age, not that many years ago. But he left a, a, a fantastic body of work. Uh, his, his most famous book was Gaia's Garden, one of the, the first permaculture books that I actually read cover to cover. Uh, and it just goes into all the different ways of looking at the world. Uh, he, he talks a lot about um, different plant guilds, that is, that is plants that do well together, provide one thing or another for each other. Uh, he talks about a lot of stuff. And he does a lot of case studies, too, which I liked a lot. Uh, you really get a feel for it working in action. Um, but yeah, so tonight we're going to uh, cover his lecture, The Permaculture City. And uh, it's, it's, it's rather long, a minute and a, or, excuse me, a minute, uh, an hour and 11 minutes. 
almost almost 12 minutes. And uh, so we may not get through all of it tonight. I'm going to do my best to, to get through it, but there's probably going to be a lot of points where I'm going to want to stop and weigh in on, on what he's talking about. And as always, if you have any questions, um, even if you haven't seen any of the, the previous videos uh, in this series, then don't, don't hesitate to ask. I'm always willing to entertain any sort of good faith questions uh, as they come along. Uh, and, so, and, that, and that's what the space is for. This is a, a space for learning, um, not a space for, you know, lording one's knowledge over another person or ridiculing them for not knowing something. So even if it's a really basic question, don't hesitate to ask. But let's get into it right now with uh, Toby Hemingway and his uh, lecture. And I think already I'm going to bump up the volume just a little bit. Let me know how the volume is, if it's not sufficient. But I'll be trying to watch that from my side as well. So there you go. It's from the Building Resilience Com uh, Resilient Communities Convergence 2015, uh, the 10th Avenue, or 10th Avenue, 10th Annual NorCal Permaculture Convergence. So that'd be Northern California. Uh, and it was on October 9th to 11th and uh, put on by Solar Living Institute in Hopland, as well as Living Mandala. And I'm not sure what that, that third symbol is. The I, I think it's supposed to be uh, like cupped hands with a, a plant growing out of it in some soil. I don't know what that one is offhand, but... There are a bunch of reasons that I wrote this book. Um, and the, the main one is that, that cities are where at least half the world's population lives. If you include metropolitan areas, the suburbs and all that, it's more like 80% of the world's population lives in cities. and it's just getting bigger all the time as these, as these megalopolises expand. So, you know, we can all move to the country and have our little acre, five acre, whatever, um, and that's great as individuals, but it's the cities that really need to be transformed. They're the leverage point that we really need to be working. So this, this actually, my journey looking at urban permaculture really started uh, a long time ago. I lived in Seattle for quite some time. My formal background's actually in genetics, and I was doing cancer research, immunology research. I got hired by a little research company, um, had tons of fun at it. It was down on the waterfront in Seattle, right next to Pike Place Market, brilliant scientific staff. We just, we had a blast working for the place. And uh, then one day we discovered something useful that actually could sell, and uh, business turned into a drug company really fast. Uh, went from 70 employees to 1,200 to 2,500 in the course of a few years. And I kind of woke up one day and said, I'm a mid-level manager at a drug company. How did that ever happen? <laughs> and at that time, my wife was working at Microsoft. She, she had started out kind of similar, got bent off of her career path. She started out as a science writer, got hired by Microsoft to edit their employee newsletter, 28 pages to 30,000 employees once a week. A huge job. We were hardly ever seeing each other. We were miserable, and we just looked at each other one day and said, "Let's stop. Let's let's like just change our lives." So, yeah. And actually, I had just playing hooky from work one day because we we had just moved to a little place in the country, uh, playing hooky from work, looking at books on homesteading. I had just discovered Bill Mollison's book. Had never heard of permaculture before, but there in the homesteading section in the Seattle Library was a big black book and I took it down and I leafed through it and it said, wow, design, patterns, ecology, plants, climate, energy, community, shelter, livelihood. These are all the things I've ever been interested in my whole life and I never understood how they all fit together. I just thought I had this weird collection of totally unrelated interests and permaculture put it all together for me. So we quit our jobs, we moved down to Southern Oregon to the Umpqua Valley. Is that a little washed out from the lights on it or it's gonna change colors? Okay, well, if it, if it starts bothering people, like say something, um, I think we'll be okay. So the Umpqua Valley in, uh, outside of Roseburg, Oregon, beautiful, beautiful place. We got 10 acres there that uh, had been clear cut in the 1970s. That's why we could afford it. The soil had washed away. It didn't have very good water, but I thought I'm learning permaculture. I can build soil. I can you know, make water or something. <laughs> um, that's a whole other story. Uh, I just put an article on my website about what to look for in land, kind of based on that experience. And 
This is definitely not an unusual experience for people that get into permaculture. Uh, it tends to be once you start learning about these ideas, you have all these dreams, I know I certainly did, of finding some sort of piece of land out in the country, building a homestead there, and, and just you know putting all these great ideas to work on, on your piece of land to do with whatever you feel like. Uh, it often doesn't end up panning out that way. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into running a business completely on your own, uh, especially a farm business, especially if you're not familiar with that type of work. There's a lot of ideas that you may think work well in practice, uh, or that, that seem to work well on paper, but don't necessarily work well on, on practice. Um, so that's not to discourage you from, from pursuing your dreams. If you do have a dream of, of being a homesteader, that's just to say, you know, be careful. And probably the best course is to ease into it. If you're, especially if you're transferring from a, a more urban life, even a suburban life into a more rural one, because there's a lot of things that can be a lot to get used to. Even just small things, like the the fact that in a lot of rural areas, there's no uh, centralized trash collection. You, you have to take your trash to the dump yourself. That, that can be something to get used to. Or the idea of being on a septic system rather than, than uh, being on just the natural sewer, or the, not the natural, but the, the uh, built sewer line that you would have in a city. And, and the different things you have to deal with with that as well in terms of maintenance and uh, in terms of not overusing it in, in certain circumstances. Um, so yeah, it can be a big transition. It can be a shock and it's, it's better in the long run to do, to, to take the permaculture principle of small and slow solutions, I would say. And, uh, yeah, ease into it. And if you can do it with a bunch of other people that, that hopefully at least one of you has <laughs> some more experience in, in rural areas. But having said that, too, of course, since this is the permaculture city that we're talking about, you can do this stuff on a different scale than than in rural areas. And you have a bunch of advantages instead trying to locate your food production facility in a city. You have things like uh, piped in water that you don't necessarily have. Uh, a lot of rural areas are in well water, which has its own difficulties to, to deal with. Uh, sometimes you can have really high nitrate levels. Um, you can have other imbalances in minerals. It just, it just depends. So you can be on city water uh, for one thing. You can uh, have a much shorter distance to get your product to market. You could even have a market in the, in the same facility if it's in a, a well-traveled enough area. So there's a whole bunch of different considerations that you can make uh, when you're when you're trying to do this in the city, so something to keep in mind. And um, we had a wonderful time there. It was awesome. We did the whole thing. You know, we grew tons of food. We just had you know, I really really cut my teeth on permaculture. We you know, I wrote Guy's Garden. We had a tremendous time. But something that I noticed right from the start was suddenly I was driving everywhere. We were putting way more miles on our cars than I had living in the city. I mean, I was taking a bus to work in the city. Here, I mean, I, I wasn't, I was working at home, but still, the nearest store was a 20 minute drive away if we wanted organic food. It was an hour's drive away in Eugene. Uh, friends, because. That's another thing to consider, too. Especially when you're just starting out, you're probably not going to be providing 100% of your food, even close to it. Uh, even when you're getting going, depending on how, uh, depending on how much you specialize, um, there's probably going to always be something. Something like salt, you know. Unless you have a salt mine out back. You're going to have to get your salt from somewhere. Uh, things like that, that, that you're just not likely to get all on your own land. So you have to plan that out as well. Where are you going to get your food from while you're starting up this, this food system? Uh, where are you going to get your entertainment from as well? Are you just going to make it yourself? You certainly could. Uh, um, you definitely have the, the peace and quiet and, and solitude to be loud and, and uh, you know, if you, if you like playing in a you know, like loud music of any kind, um, that's a good place potentially to do it because you're not going to disturb anybody. But if your entertainment is more social, you may have to, to take that into consideration as well. Is there at least a small town nearby? If so, are they a one-bar town, a two-bar town? Uh, what, what is the local clientele like? Chances are they're going to be more conservative than you uh, if you're coming into this uh, stream anyway 
Uh, so it may be it may be another thing to get used to. Another cultural shift uh, is is what are your neighbors going to be like? Chances are good that they're not going to be uh, from any sort of leftist point of view. That's not to say that that it never happens. There's definitely plenty of rural movements that have that have come from leftist ideologies. Um, so you may be lucky enough to be near one, and you may be lucky enough to actually get some land among people that, that still subscribes to that sort of thing. But more likely than not, you won't be, and you are going to be the anomaly. So that's another thing to take into consideration if you want to move out onto the land. Being in a city, that it's just the opposite. There's going to be it doesn't matter what city you go to. I mean, there's leftists in, in Salt Lake City. I, I, I met some of them when I was out there. Um, there, there are uh, anarchists in Idaho. It, it doesn't matter where you go. They, if, if there are cities, there's going to be people that are actual true leftists, not just liberals, but, but actually left. So that may be another consideration uh, when you're trying to situate, thinking about situating any sort of food production. Uh, it might just be uh, a clientele in a community that, that are more like you and are getting what you're doing, which not only is, is just good for social cohesion and, and just, you know, your own uh, socialization, but, but also could be good for business too. You know, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are, are really craving something that you're selling. If you're, you're really trying to do things in a, a way that builds ecosystems uh, in a way that, that uh, does take care of the earth and people as well as, as shares surplus. There's, there's going to be a built-in clientele if you're selling your products in a city. Um, yeah. Douglas County is a huge county. I had you know, a good friend who lived an hour and a half away. So just to socialize was, I mean, we were just burning through gasoline like mad. And then I noticed we lived on a two-mile gravel road that we shared. And that's a good point, too. Uh, what, what is it that you like to go by? Is, is it just Blatt or Blatt J. Vig? Or, or how, how do you like to be addressed? I would, I would like to know. Uh, but you say that, well, there's leftists in the country. They're more likely to keep their heads down. And you need some way of being introduced to them. That's true. And with the Internet and social media, uh, I mean, even even the countryside now has has Internet. Um, in one form or another, although they might not have wired internet, you may have to do a uh, satellite link up, another consideration. But at least with, with access to the internet, it definitely is easier to find people like you, uh, no matter where you are. So, I mean, that could be just what someone's looking for, is, is another leftist, another fellow comrade to uh, share in their, in their trials and tribulations and whatnot. But yeah, very good point. Uh, Blatt is okay. All right, we'll go, go right with that. Oh, 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 oh okay. Blatjevig, Blatjevig, is is that better? I, I I don't know. I assumed it. You stopped halfway through and it's Blatjevig. It just I don't know. Maybe it's my, <laughs> maybe it's just my way of uh, looking at words. I don't know. So Blatjevig or Blatt. I'm assuming. Well, well, we'll just go with Blatt if you like that, though. With other neighbors, sections of it would wash out each winter in the rains, and we would get 100 to 150 cubic yards of gravel, you know, 10 to 15 dump trucks gotcha. every single winter. When my neighbors got cable TV, it took a quarter mile of wire from the pole to reach their house. When we hooked up to a neighbor's well, because we didn't have very good water, uh, it was a half a mile of pipe and water. And I just kept noticing, you know, okay, I moved to the country to shrink my resource use and to have a smaller footprint, and I was using way more resources living in the country. Ah, and there's, there's another point. Um, hold on, I'm going to take one little sip. When you think about being out on the countryside, or even in the suburbs, a lot of people think, well, you have a lot more space. There's a lot more things growing out there. Your carbon footprint is going to be lighter, right? That's not always the case especially in the suburbs, because the suburbs, the houses tend to be spread out, right? Uh, but they still have all of the same resource hookups, all the utilities that a dense city would have. 
So you still have to have sewer lines running between the houses where they're not, you know, they're not serving anything between those houses, but they still have to connect house to house to house. Uh, same thing with electricity, internet, um, water, any of that stuff, sewer, I think I said sewer already. And, and then at the same time, you also tend to have very wide roads, much wider than they ever need to be in the, in the suburbs. So per capita or per acre, uh, no, I guess no matter where you slice it, you are using more resources just by being in the suburbs rather than being in, in, a, in a city. That may change once you're out in the country and you're off of the grid, so to speak, but there's still a lot of part of the grids that, uh, you know, a lot of systems you're likely to be on. You may even have a paved road out in the countryside. That's something where you have miles and miles of paved road that serves just a few cars every year. It's, it's a huge resource investment, uh, a lot of energy that goes into making that um, blacktop. Usually, it, usually it's blacktop. Uh, and so uh, yet another consideration when, you, when you're thinking about moving out there versus per perhaps being in a city where you can have all the amenities that you're used to, but because you're sharing the space with so many other people per capita, per acre, uh, it's less pollution, less of an impact, that sort of thing. So, the, so you also say, Blachevig, I'm in the same situation right now, though, checking for property listings in at least once a day. I've uh, been trying all year. Oh, well, you know, congrats to you for, for uh, trying to make that, that next step out uh, and and make something of, of your, I'm assuming you're doing food production. Um, it can be tough. Uh, and, I mean, there's a reason that so many people are leaving f farming as a profession. For one, especially in the, in the U.S., uh, since the 70s, the, the motto has been get big or get out. So they, they subsidize things in a way, like they subsidize all these crops, especially corn and soy, uh, the big staple crops. They subsidize it. They guarantee a price. So if the price, for whatever reason, goes below that and you would be losing money trying to sell your stuff, the government guarantees that price. It's a little bit of, of it, I mean, really, it's a socialized cost. Uh, when you really look at it. So, but because of that, th these profits can be very razor thin doing things conventionally. Now, the things that we don't have to worry about as much as permaculturists is uh, leasing or buying really huge, really expensive pieces of machinery. You may have a tractor. There's going to be a lot of use and utility to have a tractor even on the most sustainable of permaculture farms. There's going to be times where you need to pull out a stump, you need to dig a ditch, or do something to, to mold the land that would take way too long and too much effort to do just by hand. So there's going to be times when you need a tractor. But beyond that, you're not going to need a harvester, because with permaculture, you're never going to be doing monocropping. So you don't need to have some big harvester that's going to harvest only one type of crop um, or even uh, an orchard harvester, you know, the kind that you may have seen where it, it puts that kind of umbrella thing um, around the tree and then it shakes it and all the apples or the nuts or whatever fall off into the, the umbrella catcher thing. Uh, you wouldn't need that sort of thing either because you're going to have a lot more crops that you would then end up damaging by, by this heavy machinery. So... That can be looked at as a plus if you do things right. Uh, if you're doing a whole bunch of different harvests and they don't all happen at one time, you can spread things out throughout the year, even into the wintertime as well. There's things like persimmons that uh, they are often harvest after the first snow because they don't really ripen up until they've been frozen, <laughs> strangely enough. There are things like... Um, uh, tapping maple syrup that happens generally in I think January February depending on where you are in in the country what zone you are but uh, when, you, when you get those days where it's it's really cold in the morning and then the, the t temperature goes up like 40 degrees um, to like just above freezing that's the time when you can tap maple syrup so you can have stuff going on year-round and of course if you're using animal products as well you can be doing a lot of that during the winter um, especially with things like eggs Eggs slow down in production in the wintertime. You can kind of goose the numbers, pardon the pun, 
by by putting lights into uh, a chicken coop or, or a coop for any sort of egg laying animal and that will trick them into thinking uh that will trick them into thinking that it's it's more of the, the summertime and it'll trick them into making more eggs um but if you just want to save power and let them rest a little bit during the winter they'll still produce eggs though so you can still be getting dozens of eggs depending on how many layers you have uh, but you can get things going where you don't need that heavy machinery you can do the hand harvest as long as you're planning out your harvest times to overlap as little as possible and things are not never going to be perfect you know just because your apples went at this time last year doesn't mean that they're not going to overlap with uh say a different crop like um your squash or something this year uh so many flags you say uh pvk pvk01 yep uh those are a lot of the things that, that i believe in not all of them but those are a lot of symbols so yeah if you have any questions about any in, in specific, feel free to ask. But anyway, it can be really hard. And just finding land that's suitable, there's there's a lot of good research that you need to do before you find a good piece of land. You need to know what it's been used for, what sort of residual chemicals may be uh, lingering. There's ways to mitigate all these things. Um, but uh, I heard uh, one story of a person who bought a piece of land Things looked fine, and then they noticed once they started digging into the soil that just beneath the soil, just beneath the grasses and stuff, was garbage, like literal garbage, because this person had been using their land as an illegal dump for, like, decades. And so all of a sudden, that entire, you know, what I don't know, it was 100 acres or something like that, was, was unusable until that guy came back and got all his garbage hauled off. And they had to take him to court to do this, so, I mean, this is a long process. But that just, I mean, it just goes to show you got to be careful, you know, what what past uses there have been, how degraded your land is, um, what the level of topsoil is, what types of soil. There's there's different soil maps that you can generally access. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the resource. I can't remember what the resource is called, but there have been people who have mapped out every square inch of, of soil in all the farmlands. To tell you if it's a very loamy soil or if it's a very clay soil or a sandy soil or a silty soil what it is and that too is going to determine what sort of stuff you can grow there so you got to take that into consideration you have to take things like where the wind blows from where the sun comes from we, we talked about a lot of this stuff when we did the, the permaculture design course uh, classroom materials so um, definitely recommend going back and, and checking out those videos um, and I think I'm up to number six, uh, putting it into my archives on YouTube. If you follow that that link right there that, that Nightbot keeps putting out, you can find links to my YouTube channel and you can see all my archives of stuff. So you can, you know, if there's stuff you missed, it's, it's a good way to, to get caught up. But yeah, I, I feel for you. There's a lot that, that goes into it. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say the more people you have doing this together who you feel are... are you know, committed. You don't want to have people that, that you're just carrying along who don't want to do anything but, but make music all day, but expect to have all of the rewards from, from living out on the land. Um, or maybe you do. Maybe you don't mind that. that that's really up to you, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I, I'd say spreading that risk out amongst more people and doing it in an upfront and equitable way. So like actually forming a cooperative before you do it. That would be one way to do this forming an actual farming cooperative with people that would all homestead the same land or at least conjoining pieces of land so that you can have the crossover of, of help. Uh, it's real tough to go out there on your own. It really is. Um, and this is just from talking with people that, that have done it. You know, I, have, I haven't done that myself. Um, I've had gardens before, but, but never. And, I, and I've helped plan farms before. I've done site designs for, for farms, entire farms before, but I've never done that stuff entirely myself. But I know that there's a lot of work that goes into it and a hell of a lot of work that goes into finding the right place. And you get all that, that, that great stuff with the land. You get the perfect piece of land and the house that's on there could be structurally unsound. Um, you know, it could have plumbing issues. It could have septic issues. There's any number of issues it could have. So it really takes a lot of research. So I definitely feel for you if you're starting that journey. Um, 
and definitely, you know, I hope you continue to, to check in too and tell me how it's going. I'm really excited to, uh, to see how that turns out for you. Now, it's possible to use few resources living in the country, but you've really got to be pretty hardcore off the grid, that sort of thing. 95% um, of all rural people in the US have jobs. They don't live on the land. Only 5% actually live off of their land. So these are people who commute to jobs. They just commute longer distances. And what it really made me realize was that country life, as it's presently constituted, it doesn't have to be this way, but the American way of country life is basically suburbia with really big lawns. There's yet another point. Uh, even people that farm, I, I've, I've listened to a number of podcasts, and, and a lot of the people that, that actually are doing this, this sort of homesteading lifestyle, they'll have at least one of the people, if it's, if it's just a couple, they'll have one of the, the partners go out and have a regular job so that they can kind of support the, the, the farm operation as it, as it gets going. That's another strategy, though, too, that you could use. If you go out to the land with, with other people, even, even just a partner, one or the other of you, just to have that kind of insurance policy against complete failure, if one of you is in a good position where you can keep working a job that, that's, that's off-site, that brings in enough money to keep things going if things are not going well, that can be a way to build in resilience. Or you could have other people, in, in, you know, if you're doing it collectively, that uh, have off-site jobs that, that we all collectively pool resources together, that sort of a thing. Different, different configurations, but the point is that it can be very risky just trying to go out by your, yourself. So it might be the best strategy to hedge your bets in one way or another by having more people, by having diverse sources of income, um, at least while things are getting going. Perhaps once you get good, at no, good enough at this and you have a, a well-developed system enough, you won't need to have that off-site stuff anymore. And um, your diversity will come from the diversity of products and services that you offer on, on your land. No. The typical pattern would be someone would move from the city, clear-cut the area around their house, plant grass, put up street lights, buy an RV, you know, all this stuff, and I just realized, okay, this is driving me nuts to be consuming this many resources and to watch this. And so after a decade or so, you know, we really had accomplished what we had set out to do. So we decided it's time to move to where people were, and we were really intrigued with the city of Portland. So we moved up to Portland, and immediately, my car sat in the driveway for a week at a time. The driveway was only 20 feet long and never needed gravel. We were connected to utilities by 20 feet instead of half a mile of wire and pipe. Uh, I could walk and bike everywhere. It was a six minute ride to downtown and my ecological footprint just dropped. And at the same time, I saw an article in the New Yorker by a guy who had a similar but even more extreme experience. The article was called Green Manhattan and was by a guy who had lived in Manhattan all his life, had gotten married, lived in an apartment, when they were going to have a kid, they decided they'd move to Connecticut to you know, have a better environment for the kid. And he had the same thing happen. They hadn't even owned a car in Manhattan. Suddenly, they needed two cars. We're driving 30,000 miles a year. Jeez. His electric usage quintupled uh, and on and on. So he was talking about Manhattan is actually probably one of the greenest cities, certainly in the US, and maybe one in the world because of the high ridership of rapid transit, mm -hmm. the shared walls of all the apartment buildings but the carbon footprint of most Manhattanites is far below the U.S. average. Okay, and important qualification there. When he says that the lowest, one of the large, lowest footprints in the world, that of course doesn't take into consideration non-industrialized non parts of the world. I mean, if you live in a, in a tribal, traditional village, you've, you've, your people have lived that way for centuries, millennia, of course your carbon footprint's gonna be much lower than any Manhattan. Um, it's going to be negligible. In fact, you might even be regenerative in your, your carbon footprint. You may have a carbon negative footprint, so to speak, if you're maintaining your land well. So yeah, he's definitely coming at this from a, a Western and industrialized perspective. So keep those things in mind. That doesn't mean there's a, there, that doesn't mean there's not a lot that we can uh, it's double negative. We can still learn a lot from him. Um, there's, he makes a lot of good points and has a good way of seeing things, even though he has his particular lens that he's looking through things at. So this made me think about cities in a very different way because cities get a bad rap and city people get a bad rap. 
And it's actually possible to have a relatively small footprint. And I mean relatively in like air quotes because, you know, oh. it's the American way of life still. But it, it okay. And I haven't seen this video before. So, yeah, he, he qualified it as well. So there you have it. It intrigued me. So that's what got this book going, was just seeing the potential in cities. And what this talk is really about, I mean, permaculture, we, a lot of us come to it from gardening, but I think many of us have learned after we've been practicing permaculture for a couple of years or so, that its toolkit for working with land applies equally well to people, to energy, to water, to social justice issues, to community issues, to livelihood, all of these things. And that's really what the book is. Gaia's Garden is more of a how-to book. And this, is, this has got plenty of how-to in it, but it's really more of a book on how to think about these things. It's more for developing strategies to how to think about social justice and energy and community and livelihood uh, and all of these things. How to think about being in environments with other people. Because, I mean, growing food is really easy. Working together with other people is really the hard part of it. So that's the piece we need to work on. So. <clears throat> It's no surprise, I think, that most product innovation comes from cities. Interesting things happen in cities, though, more interesting than just, you know, more consumer goods, that sort of thing. There was a, there was a, a researcher down at the Santa Fe Institute who looked at innovation and the rates of innovation based on things like, he looked at innovation in terms of number of patents filed, new businesses started, music released, books produced, uh, these sorts of things, just anything that might come under the heading of, of innovation. And he found that there's an, an exponential effect when we get together with others. It's not just a linear effect of, you know, 10 times more people makes 10 times more innovations. It's actually that if you live in one city that's 10 times larger than another, there's 17 times more innovations coming out of that city. And if a city is 50 times larger than another, there are 150 times more innovations coming out of that city. And I think we've all felt this. You know, when I'm around really interesting, visionary, smart people, I feel like I'm getting better ideas myself. I mean, it's kind of like after that second drink when you think you're really brilliant. But you know, I think, I think this is actually a, a real effect, you know, and, and there's, there's the data on it. That you know, we get jazzed by other people and in the right environment, that can be really, really terrific. So as a- So you, so you have the, the synergy, to use a terrible business term, of, of people uh, who all are trying to do something uh, getting together, being excited that others are interested in their their sort of strategies and ideas, and the ideas are kind of playing off each other, and and in the process getting better than if they were just out on their own in a smaller place where they may not encounter as many people. So it's just the you know there's it's the law of averages. If you have a larger city, on average, you're going to have a lot more people that think like you. Um, in that in that particular container just just by the average right um so there's that and then there's also the multiplication of connections that are possible so if your town only has one bar and uh and, and it's not to to denigrate any one bar towns but just just as a matter of reality if your town only has one bar and you don't happen to like that bar you're probably not going to meet a whole lot of people uh, you're probably going to be more isolated than than your average person in that community, uh, just because, and just through the by chance, maybe you don't like the owner or whatever, you don't get along with with uh, that scene there, or or maybe you don't like bars at all, and that's the only social place in your town. So then take that example, but then blow it up to a city, of uh, you know let's say let's say like the twin cities i live in the twin cities the metro area or the between minneapolis and st paul it's about 600,000 people so just by having that many more people together there's just naturally more options for you so if you don't like the bar scene there's the opera scene there's the the um live music scene there's the uh, LARPers in the park. You could become, and, and not, not in a pejorative way, but like actual LARPers, live action role players who like get together and, and act medieval battles or whatever, um, or fantasy battles, I should even say. Uh, there's going to be running on trails and hiking and you know, all, all sorts of things that you're not necessarily going to get in a smaller town. 
So just by there being more opportunities, there's more ways for people to interact. You're then going to be more likely to meet people that are like you, uh, that share your ideas. And then that synergistic effect takes a hold and everyone's ideas get better. So that's just the trade-off between living in the city and the country. It's not saying one is better than the other. It just, that's just the way it is. Uh, so Blachevig, you say SCA are the medieval battles, more history, less form. Okay. SCA. So they don't, do they not like to refer to themselves as LARPers? I don't, I don't even know where the terminology has gone in the past. However many years since I first learned about LARPing, but, um, I don't even know what SCA stands for. So, uh, yeah, I can't even guess, but, uh, good to know. Good to know. But yeah, you know, maybe if you're into that and just by chance, if, if being in a, in a, a large town, there's going to be a better chance that some group of people, enough of group of people are going to like it, get together and, and do that thing, you know, and I, I mean, think of it in, in a relatively neutral way. Say you're really into kickball. You love kickball. You really want to be a part of a kickball team, but your town is, is not big enough to even have enough people to, to have two teams of, of kickballers playing each other, right? It's, it's a really small town. You know, there's a couple, there's like one street of houses, right? It doesn't matter how much you like kickball, you're never going to have a kickball team. Um, you're going to have to go somewhere else. It may be a long ways away. To, to even get to a, a, a city where you can have a kickball team and then have enough other teams to actually have a kickball league. But if you go to a city, just, you know, nine times out of nine, there's going to be enough people that like your same niche interest. And if it's something that takes a lot of people to like to actually get together and do, you know, you're going to have a better chance doing that when there's a lot more people. That's just the averages of it. LARP is role play. SCA is Society for Creative uh, Anachronism. Okay, good to know. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. They wear real metal armor and are barely covered and blunted weapons. Wow, that sounds very dangerous. In fact, uh, also incorporate historical crafts and food. I mean, that sounds like a lot of fun, but I don't know. <laughs> that seems a bit too dangerous for my taste. It seems like one errant sword swing and you could lose an eye or something like that. But, but that's cool that, that people are into that. I mean, it sounds like, you know, like a, like a Renaissance fe festival or medieval fair, but like just the next level of realism to it. So that's cool. Thanks for, thanks for uh, telling me about that. Let's move on in the video, though. As a permaculturist, I want to assess first what cities are from a permaculture point of view. You know, just Rather than just look at, at static definitions of cities, more dynamic and functional definitions from a permacultural approach. So, you know, what is a city? Well, the, the census definition is that it's a place with more than 25,000 people, but I don't like, you know, again, that's a static just definition. It doesn't really describe what cities do. So, yeah, right, I guess I am, thank you. I'll just sort of push myself back here. Okay, there we go. As long as I feel that against me, I'm safe. Um, but I think of cities as where the uh, technological and social processes really outweigh the ecological ones. Or another way to put that that's a little less of a mouthful is just where there's more pa pavement and people than plants. And, and even like my hometown of Sebastopol, the patterns that go on there are much more like San Francisco or New York than they are the forest nearby. You know, a very different set of patterns. So this definition really encompasses any place where there are significant quantities of people together. So small towns, suburbs, cities of any size is what I think of when I mean urban permaculture. Just any, anything that's people-related permaculture, really. So if we, if we look at what cities are and what they do, again, just to, just to round out our definition of cities, all cities have at least three major features in common, whether it is Babylon that Herodotus was writing about in the fifth century BC, or Tenochtitlan, where Mexico City is today, or Tikal, or New York City today. There are always certain features that every city, no matter who you are and where you are, you will see. You know, aliens coming down would, would identify these same qualities in cities. One of them, no surprise, is so, so here again, we see that, that multiplication of, of um, 
production in cities, even in the ancient world. There's a reason that, that before there was nation states, there were city states, is because it took that sort of a concentration of people to have enough people bouncing off ideas off each other to um, get the sort of technology where they could actually dominate the countryside that, that surrounded them. And then eventually regions or entire empires. Uh, it's just a function of having a lot of people together. That's all there is to it. There's nothing inherently better about people that live in cities. It's just they happen to have more opportunity because there's more people and more chance encounters. That's it. It's commerce. We come together to trade goods, but also to trade ideas, to trade customs, sometimes even to, you know, to intermarry and things like that, get outside our, our genetic group. So that's one. The second one is security. Uh, here is ancient Constantinople, or today's Istanbul, and you can see it's surrounded on two to three sides by water, and the third side's got mountains with a great big wall all the way around it. Tenochtitlan was connected to the mainland by several causeways that were easily sealed off because there was very little law out in the wild areas, which is a fine thing, but it made people feel insecure. And so they would come into the cities. Cities also themselves, at least back then, tended to be more lawful. They were centers of administration. There were police. There were things like that. So we gathered in cities for security. And we gather in cities to be inspired. There's always monumental public spaces, gathering places, tall buildings to look at, or temples, or other forms of monuments to, you know, to a deity, or to us, or to money, which is what most of the monuments today are built to. But that's, a, that's the third common feature. So if we look at, at these and kind of what their, what their ramifications are then, we've got security from both within and without, got exchange of goods and ideas in each other, we've got community gathering places, we've got inspira inspirational and monumental space. Cities also tend to be the administrative centers for both the city itself and the area around them. Uh, the city-state certainly was a, the kind of apogee of that. Most cities are pretty chaotic places. This is ancient Yana, older cities certainly in Syria. Uh, there, the roads go all over. Some roads go over the buildings. Pathways go through people's courtyards. They're, you know, they're very hard to navigate in. And in Europe, at least, as the Enlightenment proceeded in the 16th and 17th centuries, this really bothered those rationalists, those Enlightenment thinkers who really wanted a, you know, a solid, logical edifice for everything. And they started thinking about the planned city. How can we plan cities and design them from the top down, kind of? So here's Paris with the Arc de Triomphe in the center and then these radial avenues coming from it, kind of making sense out of the hodgepodge of chaotic uh, streets. Then here's Washington, D.C., La Enfance plan for it, uh, which is a grid overlaid with radial streets connecting. Okay. One thing that, you know, it, I guess it's just kind of an aside, really. But uh, there's a reason that a lot of the ancient cities tended to be very convoluted in, in the way they were constructed. And that's because it was defensive. It was more defensive that way. If you had people who were trying to scout out your city for an invasion, they would tend to have a tougher time mapping things out because things, you know, roads doubled back on themselves. were very narrow or, you know... It was, it was never really easy to find a, a way marker, you know, because there was just so much built up overhead that you couldn't really see much of the horizon. Things like that. So, so there was definitely a defensive reason for that to, to have been the case, but also just because things kind of happened haphazardly. Uh, as you said, there was no central planning necessarily. So you want to build a shop and you happen to own a piece of land, you're going to build it however you feel like it, even if it, you know, squishes, it encroaches on the road a little bit or, it, you know, kind of towers over your neighbor. There was no there was no zoning code basically or, or building code I should say and and also no zoning and then there's another reason that that cities like Washington DC are laid out as they are and that was uh, especially with DC that was to intimidate foreign dignitaries uh, so the reason they have all these radial roads you see like uh, in, it may be kind of hard to see on the the screen there but um, there's that that circle right in the middle of the picture there and then all the roads radiate from it uh, and then they go to other radials that radiate from that so that's for one reason you can navigate by the monuments just going through dc because you can see your way you know straight down the avenue to the next monument and get away around that way but also each of those monuments is supposed to reinforce 
the U.S.'s uh, power and grandeur and and modernity and all these all these things. So, um, yeah, it's it's not just because they wanted things to be more orderly. There's definitely there's always more to the way cities are planned than just order versus whatever. You know, there's there's people that want the city as as a whole to say something or function in a certain way, and so that always goes into factoring how cities come together. It. So rationalizing cities by redeveloping them, by changing them. And it, this really reached its peak with the work of Le Corbusier in the 1930s to the 1960s. And uh, it's not Le Corbusier, Corbusier as, as the subtitles are guessing at. It's Le Corbusier, uh, is this, this uh, French... Um, Man, I'm forgetting my, my planning history here. But anyway, he was this, this big city planner, uh, and his idea was to have towers in a park. And his model is the reason that, well, let's see if he gets to that, and if he doesn't, I'll, I'll interject as well. These or so, who he designed the Radiant City, which, thank God, was never built. Uh, this is Chandigarh. In it, it somewhat was built, though, his idea of towers in the park was adopted in especially in in new york city's uh housing projects so you see these massive towers you even see that in, in like minneapolis and, and st paul um you'll have these massive towers surrounded by parkland um that are kind of set back from the road and uh the idea is that you would have both nature and uh urbanity uh right next to one another and you know, you have the best of both worlds. It doesn't tend to function that way. What tends to happen is you'll have areas that aren't lighted that well that end up being dangerous uh, in the nighttime just because you can't light everything in, in a huge park uh, economically. Uh, you have these, these buildings that, that are set way back from everything else so you're still ending up having to be de dependent on a car a lot of the time, uh, or you have to walk a long way just to get to a bus stop. And it, do it just doesn't facilitate the neighbor interaction that it was supposed to. Um, so, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. In, in India, which actually was built, it's an administrative center, top down, completely designed and built, uh, and no one wanted to live there. The people would work, and then they would move from whatever apartment they were given. Many of them moved to the outskirts of town and put up their own little dwellings around it. And this, this really demonstrates the, the need for the principle of small and slow solutions. This, this as, as he says, top-down. So it's, it's from the planning department. They, they come out with this grand design, how this is going to work, that's going to work, all, this, all these different parts are going to work together. They, they tend to focus a lot, for one thing, on the aesthetics of things, much more so than the actual likely functionality of them, let's say. So they lay things out very neatly, but then people don't have neat needs and lives and desires. So, so things end up just being more chaotic because you're, you're impressing your idea of what a city should be onto the people that actually have to live there. Because these people don't end up living there, and the people that design this stuff... They just design it, then they move on. They get a bunch of accolades and awards, they move on to another project. So this is, this is the opposite of small and slow solutions. This is one solution that we've now put so much money, so much planning, and, and so much literal material into that it's hard to then back out of. So if things go badly, if people don't use them as you imagine they will, uh, there's no backing out. You just kind of, kind of live with it until it's it's run its entire useful life, and then you can bulldoze it, say good riddance, and, and try something different. If instead you do what is known as incrementalism, where you build one thing, you see how it does, um, and then based on that feedback, you build another thing in the same area, and you just keep going like that in in a more you know experimental yet still deliberate fashion. You can still have nice gridded streets. Uh, you can have uh, a good density of, uh, or a good uh, distribution of parkland. You can, you, can, you can do things in an intentional way and have them also be incremental. 
but you're just re you're reacting to the needs at the time. And another thing about these grand designs is they tend to take so long to get cleared for de for development and then finally get developed that the city has changed uh, by the time that they're actually complete. So the needs of the city have changed at that point. So it may not even make sense anymore to, to do things the way they are. There may be people, you may be having an, a population loss by the time you build all these different high rises and stuff. So that's another reason not to do it that way. The, the incremental way is, is, is more responsive to the, the now and the near future, right? It's, it's the needs that we have now plus the, the needs that we're anticipating for the near future. And then little by little, you move along. And, um, and also that, that puts a lot more people's ideas and minds behind it than just one person's grand design. It's, it's never a good idea to have one person do completely all the planning of anything because they're always going to have their strengths and weaknesses. They may be really good at, at picking out design styles that really fit with the character of a particular neighborhood or even a whole city, but they may be really bad at, at traffic planning, you know, they, they may not even care about having street trees or something like that. Something that really means a lot to a lot of people and makes cities more livable and uh, uh, more resilient and sustainable at the same time. You know, all the services they provide from stormwater collection to shading of, of what otherwise would be very heat absorbing asphalt uh, to habitat for living things to just beauty and, and a sense of place. Um, but if you're some grand design sort of guy and you want these neat lines and the trees are just too, you know, oddly shaped and irregular to include them, then you may do away with that. And then an entire section of the city is, is without trees instead of the other way around where you have a bunch of people doing a bunch of things and one guy doesn't like trees. So his smaller development doesn't look so great and people don't like it as much. And, but then overall, People do like trees. Uh, other designers do like trees. So you haven't lost everything. So that's that's the benefit of, of small and slow solutions. On the outside, because it's so sterile. I mean, these are places that look great from 30,000 feet. They're beautiful and they're orderly. And you get down in them and they are sterile and dead. So this really reached its peak, this whole rationalization of cities and planning, central planning and all that, with this guy, this is Robert Moses, oh. who ran... Oh my. I hope to one day cover the book, uh, the, the, the Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs, uh, who is my favorite urban planner, I would say, of all time. Yeah, uh, really was the, the godmother of new urbanism and just really had a good handle on the way that, that neighborhoods actually function. Um, and she was, uh, in, in real life, was a major opponent of Robert Moses and was actually the, the person who ended up being his downfall. He managed to accumulate so much power within New York City that he was the head of several major boards all at the same time somehow. And then he just used all that power to ram freeways into the heart of the city from all different sides because his whole thing, his grand vision, there's that thing again, grand vision of one person was to have keep cars moving, move them as fast as they can in and out of the city. That's going to facilitate the most business to happen, the most uh, uh, accessibility to all these different parts of, of the region, all these different things. He loved cars. He wanted to keep them moving. So his grand idea was to slam these, these freeways through. So he would just shoot them in a straight line, regardless of what was in his way. He would get all the necessary, um, uh, it's not permits, but he would get all the necessary paperwork done to uh, use eminent domain, to seize everything that was in the, the freeway's path. Didn't matter if the neighborhood opposed it. Didn't matter if it even served the local neighborhood, because it wasn't about any particular neighborhood for him. It was about the whole functioning of the city, and he wanted to just keep those cars moving. It didn't matter what one little, you know, old lady who lived in her house for her entire life thought about a freeway plowing through her backyard. She was just, she just had to go. She had to be relocated in the name of progress. Until they got to uh, Greenwich Village, I want to say, is where she was uh, originally from. And she was uh, experienced in organizing. 
She had a lot of organizing experience. So where all these other neighborhoods were getting caught off guard with this, this, these big development uh, infrastructure plans coming through and just bulldozing them, literally and figuratively, she, was get, she knew how to say no and get the people organized to, to go to city council meetings, to get the plans done away with. Say, this is a real neighborhood here. These are real people, and you're going to destroy the entire character of it if you slam your big freeway through it. And eventually she won. She and her cohorts won. And Robert Moses never recovered from that. He never regained all the power that he used to have because then at any time he tried one of these projects, people would oppose him. It shows what the power of organization can do as well. Uh, if you know what you're doing and you have enough people that have a, a literal stake uh, uh, or a major stake, I should say, in the outcome of a certain plan. She also wrote a great book, which I, which I mentioned, Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she lays out how she thinks cities uh, and particular neighborhoods should function. She came up with the idea of, of eyes on the street. This, this, um, it's more of a hypothesis than a, than a hard and fast theory, because we're talking about the social sciences here. But the idea being that if you have, say, porches or balconies or, or other either public or semi-public spaces, like, like your porch or your balcony is kind of in between the public and the private, right? You're, you're out somewhat in the public. You can be seen by people. You can interact with those people. You're a part of that neighborhood. You're not within the walls and privacy of your house. So if you have more of those in-between spaces and more public space that people are allowed to just congregate in, you're going to have more people watching for problems. It could be anything from, you know, someone uh, uh, falls off their bike and hits their head. Well, there's people right there that can rush to help. Uh, but, but to greater problems, people get into an argument and start, you know, fighting and, and potentially really hurting each other. You have more people to, to yell, oh, hey, stop that, or, or um, deal with it without having to involve the police. Um, so she came up with that idea, eyes on the streets. And uh, she, she talked about a vibrant neighborhood as, 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 or a vibrant street as being the cheerful hurly-burly of the neighborhood. So there's a lot of different things going on, a lot of noises coming at you from different places, a lot of different cultures mixing all at the same time. It seems maybe from the outside to be chaotic, but together it all works and makes for a worthwhile place to live, a vibrant neighborhood. A place where you have a lot of different options for uh, entertainment or, or um, just socializing or, or any number of or organizing. Uh, a place that is alive rather than just sterile yet functional. So she called that the cheerful hurly-burly of the, of the streets. Um, yeah, definitely want to cover her in, in future streams, but not tonight. <laughs> all of the construction authorities in Manhattan um, and really New York State for about 30 years, uh, all the bridges. So he built, or he, he could at the stroke of a pen get anything built. He had so much power. He was one of the most powerful people in the country. If you're interested in that kind of power, that kind of power over, uh, his biography is a book called The Power Broker and it really shows how he did it. It's horrifying. But he built the Triborough Bridge, the Whitestone Bridge, the uh, Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the Cross Bronx Expressway, FDR Drive, Shea Stadium, Lincoln Center. He remade New York City, and he essentially created suburbia almost single-handedly by building all these expressways going out into the suburbs, and people just blew out of the city like a pressure cooker. There's another thing that, that perhaps you haven't uh, considered before. Who are the freeways for when it comes to cities? Is it for the local residents so they can access wider areas more uh, easily? Not primarily. Primarily, freeways are for other cities, the suburbs, to make it easier for people to live way outside of the city and commute in. So in exchange for providing convenience, for suburbanites and, and even people in rural areas to be able to access jobs in the city, what that actual city has to give up is tons and tons, acres and acres and acres of prime real estate to then build freeways on. Uh, if you think about it, a well-functioning city, you don't really need to leave for most of your daily needs. You have your job within the city likely because there's the greatest concentration of jobs. 
Uh, you have transportation that, that can take you there relatively efficiently if you have a good mass transit system. Um, and you have all the sort of entertainment and, and shopping needs that you could ever want. You know, uh, just a entire array of things that, that having access to those suburbs is not really going to enhance all that much or having easy and fast access to. So freeways are always for other cities um, or I should say urban freeways are always for the benefit of other freeways at the expense of that city itself. Just look at a map sometime. Uh, look at look at any major city uh, that that's been you know built up since like say the 1970s or something like that. Any of these cities that have large freeways that go straight through them, not not around, but but straight through. And you can just you compare the amount of land that's taken up by the freeway versus the amount of land that's taken up by adjacent neighborhoods. And you, and then you start to think, well, I mean, what if we had all that land for more people to live in, more people to work in, other activities, and the trade-off, the only trade-off would be that people who live outside the city would have a more difficult time getting into it. That seems like a better trade-off to me, especially if you then have good mass transit, robust mass transit, that you can then move people around the city efficiently without spreading things out more. Because that's another thing. Car infrastructure always spreads people out. The more car infrastructure you have, the more parking lots, the more freeways, the wider the roads, the more things are physically spread out. So the more you have to rely on your car to get from place to place. Even if you live within a city, you know, within walking distance of some things, if things are spread out a lot because of car infrastructure, you're going to have to rely on that car more often or, or a good mass transit system. But having a good mass transit system reduces the need for parking and freeways and wider streets and all that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so Wasted Youth 24, oh, 241 says, Yep, and all, the, and all there is traffic here in San Diego. So mass transit from suburbs to city and other areas. I mean, ideally, that, that would work well, too, having more commuter transit, you know. So scale your mass transit to the, the scale of density that you're talking about. In the city core, have more stops, and then once you get further out and out into lower and lower densities, have fewer stops uh, to the point where you're out in the suburbs and you may have only one stop per city, and, and maybe you have... Uh, a commercial district that pops up around it if you facilitate it in the right way and then perhaps a, a park and ride or some some sort of thing where you can then concentrate the traffic in the suburbs keep it in the suburbs and then just have mass transit be the to and from that sort of thing so ideally but but definitely mass transit within cities is always going to be better than car infrastructure in terms of getting around more people and keeping things closer together, right? Uh, so you say, because it's nearly impossible now to have people not travel from suburbs to work. Uh, commutes here are typically 20 to 45 minutes. Uh, that's, that's pretty typical for a lot of the country. Uh, not once you get up to the eastern seaboard or, or into like places like L.A. or places that have you know really dense cities. I, I'm, I'm assuming Chicago commutes are, are pretty gnarly as well. Um, but yeah, it, you know, imagine rather than, than having to sit in traffic, uh, you could just park at a, a park and ride and then, you know, play on your phone. You know, <laughs> wouldn't have to worry about people texting and driving because the, the operator of the, the car, or the, the, the mass transit car is driving. You'd have more time, too. So you could still live in the suburbs, still relatively efficiently get in and out of the city. Uh, you just, it takes a shifting, uh, an inversion, really, of priorities from car infrastructure to mass transit infrastructure. And then for everyone that still has to drive in, in these, you know, highly uh, articulated mass transit areas, anyone that still has to drive, like, like I'm a, a, a landscaper, I have to drive for my job. I have to haul plants around. I have to haul all sorts of materials around. Um, There'd be, mu there'd be less traffic on the road to have to deal with. So you don't have to have as wide of roads anymore. You can shrink that infrastructure as well at the same time. Uh, so I, I would love it if, because uh, oftentimes I work in downtown Minneapolis. And by the end of my, my day, 
I have to plan an entire hour just to get back to the shop because of, of traffic coming out of the city. It's ridiculous. Uh, and, and the shop is just in a, in a suburb of, of uh, uh, the Twin Cities as well. So that's a lot of time that I'm losing because so many people are leaving the city in their cars at the same time. If there was good mass transit, you'd get a lot of those people off the roads and I would be like smooth sailing, basically. So there's that advantage as well. Uh, that's without traffic. Oh, with traffic, it's one to two hours. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I would want, too, if I was sitting in traffic for two hours. Because who wants to, to, to waste large chunks of your life just sitting in traffic? That seems like just a, a terrible existence. Um, unfortunately, now I've, I've lived in inside uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul for the past uh, five years now. So... I've never had to deal with, with those sorts of commutes because I'm always going opposite traffic, no matter where I work. Um, oh, so you'd rather have better public transit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd rather have better public transit as well. I'm right there with you. Um, and that's going to be a big video that I do in the future where I lay out a different way of looking at public transit. And I'm going to take some bad ideas and uh, just fish out the good parts of them and, and perhaps combine them in a way that we can actually get a robust and good system that... that hasn't really been seen before. So stay tuned for that in, in future episodes. I think I'm really going to start working on that once I get through this this permaculture series. Um, so that, yeah, that's definitely something I have planned for, for future streams, though. Um, talking about the future of transit, just, just put it that way. But let's move on to the video. Through the suburbs. And here he is with one of his pet little projects, and you can see how clean and sterile it all is. And his way of working would be uh, urban renewal, he would tear down whatever was there, displace all the people who lived there, just rip it out, and then they'd build something that looked like this. Yeah, and most of these have been torn down because they're just, they're unlivable, they're horrible places, and they're crime-ridden, and, you know, everyone's anonymous, and there's... And you have to keep in mind, too, that, that a lot of the reason that these housing projects were destined to fail is because of, of capitalist myths. The idea that if you're poor, you only deserve to have the very basic minimum of a, of a uh, standard of living because you're just lazy and you're, you should be so lucky to, to, that we as a, a city care enough about you to, to put a roof over your head. Even if it leaks half the time, even if it's roach infested, you should be so lucky that you're not out on the street, that sort of thing. So that's one reason that these, these places failed. Uh, and so from the get-go, they were planned in a way that it was just seen as, as mass housing. You know, you'll hear it referred to that a lot as mass housing, um, uh, where you're just trying to get as many people into units as possible. And a lot of these other details of quality of living don't even come into play. Um, it's a really tragic way to, to look at people. And it's, it's, it takes not into, it doesn't take into account people's material conditions that they're born into at all at all it, it 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 assigns way too much agency to average individuals and their ability to overcome whatever obstacles they have in their lives welcome strin good to see you tonight uh talking urban planning tonight uh, and and the the addition of, of permaculture trying to fuse those two together so anyway this this uh, this idea of of poor people deserving their lot in life that's one major reason that these housing projects failed because they were never really meant to be more than than just the bare minimum right just the bare okay i guess we won't let you starve on the street because we don't like looking at homeless people that sort of thing so of course they failed that that's not how you have to do it there's there's plenty of countries um perhaps i'll look at that up and we can cover it sometime a lot of a lot of scandinavian countries look at their public housing completely differently they look at it as as a a, a way to give people a, a base to then push off of, right? So they'll have things like, you know, amenities that you see in, in luxury apartments. They'll have a workout room. They'll have a pool. They'll have gathering spaces and, and greenery and stuff like that. And they'll be on transit lines and or, or close to a lot of employment because you want these people to get jobs, right? And, and one way that you can get a job is by being able to walk there or, or taking a short bus ride. Um, so it doesn't really do you any good to set you way out in the middle of uh, a giant super block that you have to walk across every day, even in the freezing cold, just to get to a bus or that sort of thing. 
Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways you can do public housing. Uh, Cuba's got over 90% home ownership rate, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Blachevic, that, that's very important, too. Um, if we were to do away with landlords um, and, and start pushing things towards people actually owning their own place, you know, cooperatizing their, their various apartment complexes uh, into condominiums, cooperative condominiums, um, uh, taking over these, these homes that are just used as investment properties that don't actually house anybody, uh, strictly regulating things like Airbnbs that have, have done terrible things to the housing market as well, keeping prime real estate vacant, essentially, uh, not, not for residential use, but just for, you know, um, hotel use, like a, a, an off the books hotel, basically, um, these sorts of things. Uh, China has eliminated absolute poverty. A another good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these, these, these highly capitalistic countries tend to, to have to hang on to that myth that, that somehow people deserve their lot in life and that we have some sort of meritocracy because otherwise it, it, it starts to pick at the, the fabric that makes up the capitalist system and it could unravel it if people thought about it too much because if people didn't deserve their lots in life, well, then we should change their lot in life, right? We should be giving them more of a, a leg up. If, if all those people didn't deserve their millions or billions, if it was in one way or another ill-gotten gain, we might have some sort of uprising and uh, not put up with that sort of thing anymore. Uh, so you mean, so <laughs> Wasted Youth says, you, you mean they don't punish and demonize the poor? <laughs> I don't think America will ever not know how to do that. Well, hey, uh, I have optimism in that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this at all, uh, that, that people can change their views and that um, maybe all it takes for a lot of people is just a little change in the way that they, they view things they can send them in a completely different direction and they can start picking up these better ideas. And the only people coming up with good ideas for helping all people are people on the left. That's just how it is. And I'm not talking again, I'm not talking about liberals, people actually on the left, people that are beyond capitalism and this idea of enforced hierarchy uh, that, that just has to go. All right. Moving on in the comments here. What flag is the one with the Triforce over it? Yeah, you know what? I did model that to look a little bit like the Triforce. If you notice my my channel icon, it's it's the same thing. Uh, that's that's my symbol that I've come up with for my concept that I call Solaris, which which is a Latin word that means from the sun. And there's a lot of symbology that goes into it. Of course, behind it you have the anarcho-communist flag. I can see a lot of good things from both of those traditions so that's why i included it but the the circle with the triangles inside uh represents the three different areas of knowledge that i'm trying to synthesize so or three different philosophies we'll put it that way so we have new urbanism uh, and if you look at the top left hand corner of those flags that represents new urbanism if you go over to the top right hand side the very right corner that represents permaculture uh, which we're talking about a lot tonight those two things and then the, the bottom middle, that, uh, that triangle that's, that's you know, folding in on itself, that's a uh, leftist unity flag. So we have leftism, new urbanism, and permaculture that I'm trying to put all together because I think at the heart of each of them is interdependence and interconnectedness, and, and I think that's what we should be focusing on. So that's why it's Solaris of the sun. So that, that circle is supposed to represent the sun. And it shines through those middle triangles as, as uh, the sun and, and stars literally shine through our entire lives. Um, they're the reason for all the energy and the material that we use in a daily basis. We are made of, of former stars. So I think it's a good symbol for interconnectedness. So you have the, the triangles arranged in a, a simple fractal. Uh, that represents the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. It is also representing um, solidarity with various downtrodden people throughout history. You have that triangle being used as a marker for socialists as well as, as the Jews in the Holocaust, uh, as a symbol for LGBTQIA rights later on, um, and uh, just as, as feminism in, in general, I think is an important thing to, to bring into 
our thoughts and ideas. So you have that. You have the green of the triangles representing the green of the earth, um, to keep that in mind. So we have the, the, the black of anarchy, the red of, of communism, the green of the earth, and then the yellow of the sun that, that ties it all together, right? So that, that's, that's a little bit of, of what's gone into that. But yeah, you know, uh, Legend of Zelda games were, were really big influences in my childhood. So I kind of modeled it a little bit after the Triforce as well. So I admit that, that that's in there as well. Uh, so Wasted Youth says, sorry, I am trying hard not to be a nihilist anymore. And it is hard. It absolutely is hard. Um, you know, <laughs> that, that capitalist realism is, is a pervasive force in this world. The idea that it's, it's always going to be like this. And we have the, the powers that be are just too powerful and we're never going to overcome them. But, uh, as Ursula K. Le Guin says, and I never quote it exactly right, but but basically, the divine right of kings also seemed inevitable and eternal. It, it seemed like their power was too great to ever overcome, and yet we overcame it. You know, we moved on past feudalism and serfdom to capitalism, which definitely is a step up uh, in many ways. But there's no end of history. There's no final form. There are always weaknesses in any system. And there's always good people that, that want to make the world better for everyone, not just themselves and their families. Um, so that gives me some degree of hope. Uh, it's a lot easier with social, without social media. A very good point. Blachevik. Uh, all right. And welcome in, Dak Apollyon. Decompressing after my nephew's sixth birthday party. Oh, man. Those little kid birthday parties can be <laughs> quite the ordeal. Not so much for the kids. You know, for the kids, it's, they, you know, it's overstimulation to the max. But for the parents especially, it's like herding cats who also have cake and are loaded up on sugar and the, the apprehension and, and jealousy of toys being given out and all that sort of thing. So I feel for you. Uh, catch you later as well, Wasted Youth. I hope to see you in, in future streams. Good to see you. All right, I think that catches up on the com on the comments now, so we'll, we'll head on uh, with more of the video. There's no way to actually meet or form community or anything like that, so most of them have been torn down. There's still a few of these projects left. So his next vision was to build the Lower Manhattan Expressway, which was going to be an expressway that was going to run straight through Greenwich Village and down into that part of Lower Manhattan, and when he put out the plans, he didn't realize that he was going to have to contend with this woman, who is one of my heroes, Jane Jacobs. She had just published an article in Forbes called Downtown is for People that was absolutely showing why it was just crazy to do these sorts of top-down planning. To and I, I couldn't have said that better. When we're thinking about planning for cities, we have to say, who are the cities for? Are they to transport cars? Are they to shuttle people away that we don't like? Or are they for the flourishing of humanity, the, 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 uh, the, the lives and the livelihoods and the, the interactions of people? And, and depending on which answer you give, that's going to really determine how your, your city comes out in the end. Um, freeways are for cars, and especially if it's a, a, at the expense of housing and businesses and other great stuff in, a, in a, um, St. Paul. The, uh, the main expressway, the, the, the East-West Expressway that goes through the heart of town, um, I-94, was plowed straight through the wealthiest black neighborhood in the entire metro, probably in the entire state, I, I would venture to say. And they did it for similar reasons. Um, for one thing, because even though it was the wealthiest black neighborhood, they were still politically relatively weak compared to other adjacent neighborhoods. So they knew that there would be less pushback if they pushed it through there. Um, also, there was just less money than other wealthier neighborhoods, like white neighborhoods uh, that were not that far off. So they just straight on through, just along this, this uh, street. It used to be called the Rondo neighborhood, and they bisected the entire thing, and the neighborhood really lost cohesion after that. And it hasn't really recovered since then. 
it's not as though anywhere in Minneapolis and St. Paul is all that dangerous or downtrodden uh, overall, especially when you consider um, when you compare it to other bigger cities like uh, even Chicago, New York, stuff like that. Um, but still, there's a lot of poverty there. And a big part of that was the destruction of that neighborhood. They didn't care. They put it right through the, the central business district and it destroyed all that for generations. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there's no such thing as a neutral uh, planning policy. And in that case, literally, they decided that the, that part of the city was going to be for cars and not for people. Um, and I think they chose wrong. To plan for cars, to plan for business, but not to plan for people. And she, her argument was you can't plan. You can't, you can't do that kind of design. Design has to come from the bottom up when mm -hmm. you're talking about right. people. Uh, and she was able to, along with a bunch of other people, get the Lower Manhattan Expressway knocked out. She essentially destroyed Robert Moses. He was kind of shuffled off the stage. Mm -hmm. Corruption was revealed in his office. Surprise, surprise. Things like that. <laughs> but she, she wrote an incredible manifesto called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, mm -hmm. which is, although it's 50 years old now, it's well worth reading still. It's, it's, like, it's a permaculture book. It's just amazing. She came up with the term social capital. That's, that's hers. That is Jane Jacobs who, who came up with that. Uh, she also came up with the idea, the importance of mixed use, the importance of having businesses where people live rather than segregating them, which will give you a dead suburb during the day and a dead city at night. Yeah. Uh, so integration rather than segregation. This is a literal application of that, having what's known as mixed use. And you definitely see that more often in, in major cities with, with um, newer developments, where they'll at least have that bottom floor be for things like retail and then, and then have apartments or condos above. But it doesn't have to end there. You could have several floors, and they don't all have to be retail. Uh, in fact, unless you have a walkway on the second or third floor that, that you know, goes along the, the level of the building, it's nearly impossible to have retail up that high and have it flourish. It's just one of those planning maxims that seems to hold true, that retail has to go on the bottom, has to go on street level. Uh, the only time Incidentally, where that's different is in shopping malls. And the reason that you can have multi-level shopping malls is because you have, a, like I said, a walkway that goes along the level. So you can just do like window shopping and stuff. You can get right in and right out. Um, you have elevators that, that bring you between the levels, uh, all that sort of thing. But mixed use can be a lot more than just retail and residential. You can have light industrial. You can have artist lofts. You can have light manufacturing that... As long as all the pollution stays within the confines of the, the envelope of the unit, you can allow it to continue there. Uh, you can have different sorts of business. You can have just commercial space in general, business space, office space. And those can all go on second and, and third and, and higher levels. That There's no problem doing it that way. Um, so yeah, but by putting all that together, you have, again, the potential of... of having more interactions because you're just literally going to pass more people on your way to work or, or school or yeah, school is another thing you could have in a mixed use development, but you're just going to pass more people and interact with more people. It tends to just have community naturally accrete around itself. Uh, and then as he said, you don't have one area that's dead during the day and then everyone goes back to the other area at night and back into the bedroom suburbs and then the, the downtown's dead. Experienced that a lot in places like St. Paul downtown. They've tried really hard to build up a, a bar and and brewery and nightlife, uh, you know, nightclub sort of scene, but it's it's been very slow going. COVID dealt it a really big hit. A lot of the the main stretch that was developing has been shuttered, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, they suffer from that, where where people just come into the city for their jobs and then they just leave at night. Um, not as much Minneapolis downtown. They've managed to, to maintain a, a nightlife, but they have to keep working really hard to, to keep it going. And it'll be interesting to see how it, it comes back out after, assuming COVID ever leaves us, uh, after that, that time happens. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, mixed use means more use for the same square footage, right? Um, it's a more efficient way to do things. And you have to rely on cars less between those different stops. Say if, if you 
lived in a bit you could you could then you know imagine like uh, if you ever played sim tower uh where you could live in a building you could uh have your office in the same building you could have uh, restaurants food courts um movie theaters all sorts of these things all in the same building so you don't really need a car to go in between any one of those things now in the real world chances are you're gonna have one of those things like you're not likely to live in the same building that you work in um, unless you've worked it out that way it's like one of those old style uh, restaurants like bob's burgers where you have the restaurant on the bottom with with housing above and you rent from the same person but unless you're doing something like that you're likely to live somewhere else but with more opportunities to work nearby there's less of a need for a car or less chance that you'll need a car um, to go between those places and then you bring in entertainment to that same space and 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 food and shopping grocery stores you can have that all nearby and uh yeah it, it would function more like a, a small village than the core of a major city right that's the idea there all right moving on places that are half dead most of the time in other words you know these are vibrant places she talked about mixed ages in buildings. Mm -hmm. You can't just bulldoze something and build everything new because only corporations can afford the new rents. If you want bodegas and bookstores and cafes and the places that people actually go and where their lives are based, you need mixed ages so there's less expensive rents. You need eyes on the street. That's what the mixed use gives you. That's, that makes a city safe. She has great anecdotes of, you know, just some kind of funny looking guy talking to a little girl and all of a sudden there are like eight people watching him you know just paying attention to what's he up to is he okay you know those sorts of things that's what you need to make to make cities that are human she also talked about the importance of what i think of as a fractal city that's made of a lot of small parts that are loosely combined rather than a big monolith and i'm going to talk a lot about portland because it's a city that i knew really well and i know best of all since i lived there for six years very recently and what makes Portland, one of the things that makes Portland a really vibrant city is it is divided into 95 neighborhoods. They're formal neighborhoods. Each one has a neighborhood association that is entitled to FaceTime in front of the city council whenever they want. Uh, so it's a voting neighborhood association. And those 95 neighborhoods are about 5,000 to 10,000 people apiece so that they're, they're villages, roughly. So it's not a monolithic city of 600,000, it's 95 villages, and people really identify with their village, with their neighborhood. I lived in the Brooklyn neighborhood, and my friend Mark Lakeman was down in Selwood, and you know my other friends are in Buckman, and that sort of thing. That's, that's, that's what you did say you live in Portland, you say you live in Buckman. And this is a trend that you see in the most uh, livable, for lack of a better term, cities. Cities that, that people really like to live in, really feel like it's it's a place unique among all other places. You'll see that each neighborhood is treated more like a small village where you spend most of your time just in the neighborhood. You can get most of your needs met in that, that same small area. And again, just through the, the chance interactions, community starts to form. You, you see someone on, on the bus who you, you then see at the bodega, who you then see at a bookstore, and over time, you probably have a chance to meet that person and get to know them in some way. Um, you might find out you have similar interests and you, you organize something together. Uh, that sort of thing. That, that is a lot harder to hap have happen if, you know, like I say, people are coming all into one central core and then all leaving because they're going all, they're spreading themselves all across the horizon. So even if you meet someone downtown, like say you're on your lunch break and, and uh, from your job in downtown, you meet someone, you strike up a conversation, they may live the complete opposite end of the metro. Now there's a, a much lower chance that you're ever going to make that any more than, than you know, a lunchtime friendship, right? Um, but if they live in your neighborhood, or they're more likely to live in your neighborhood, there is that potential that you'll see them around. You'll get to think of them not just as, as you know, background to your daily life and travels, but uh, real people with real lives that you get to know and be a part of. You get integrated with. This is how community is built, just through these chance interactions. And they, But you have to have the potential for that to happen. You have to facilitate things in a way where you can have that happen. And, and another important factor in that is to have these, what's, what's known as third spaces, places that are not work or home, 
um, but a third space. It could be a park, it could be a cafe, it could be something. But it's all, it's very important to have a lot of third spaces where you can just be, right? So like a plaza or a park where you can just hang out without having to buy anything, without having any suspicion of why you're there. Um, because that tends to lead to more satisfaction in, in the, the town you live in, uh, you know, taking more ownership of it as, as a resident. And then again, those, those encounters that, that facilitates those encounters, especially with people that don't necessarily have the money to, to eat at a, a restaurant that you like, right? This is one place where you can meet people that are in different socioeconomic classes than you. These third spaces that are free to everybody. So this, this fractal approach then scales up because in Portland, these 95 neighborhoods then coalesce into larger groups of neighborhood coalitions. Each one of those colored blocks is a dozen to 25 or so neighborhoods. And these have real political clout. They get time with the mayor and time with the city council. They can actually write legislation, propose legislation. So they have a lot of power. So what you've got is this. You can, you can see in this kind of the rudimentary uh, forms of some of the power structures that, you know, when, when I do my theory streams, uh, they've been Wednesdays lately, because I've been doing it with the For We Are Many podcast, but we've been reading State and Revolution. And we just got through a section where, where Lennon was talking about how he sees an, a, an, a society, uh, a society's political power structured. So at the base level is the village, or you could think of it as the base level being a neighborhood, just like we have here. And then the neighborhood sends a representative to the city, which rep sends um, a representative to the region, and then to the national level, that sort of thing. So you see the rudiments here when you have these neighborhoods that actually have clout with the people that represent them politically. Um, it's definitely not uh, anywhere near close to a, a communist sort of ideal or an anarchist ideal um, or even a socialist ideal, but, but it's, it's definitely headed in the right direction, right? A city that has individuals who form families and households that live on blocks, that form neighborhoods, that form neighborhood coalitions, that have upwards input into the city government rather than just simply stuff flowing down from the government. And that's a really important piece to, to make cities livable is this upward movement of information. Mm. The grassroots again. I mean, it's, it's no surprise to anybody in permaculture, but, but this is, you know, th these are the rules. These are the guidelines and the things we know. You can't design a whole city. You can design a framework that allows interesting things to emerge by putting together these, these loose pieces. You know, we've got people who inspire one another. We create sacred space together. The city has administration that allows people to feel secure. Then we can gather safely and we create community. We exchange goods, we exchange ideas, and they all link together in this fantastic webwork of very loosely connected, dynamic, shifting relationships with each other. And that's the part that you can't design very far. What, one of the phrases that, that I like in permaculture is we talk about creating the conditions for X to occur. You just set the stage, and then you let new interesting things emerge from it. And that's the kind of, I think of that as design without design. We know that these processes are bigger than we are, and we have the hubris to admit that. So we just use permaculture's methods and principles to set the stage for these things to happen. And this is really important with cities because you can't manage people like that. And that's a, that's a key point. You're not trying to micromanage every single aspect. You're just trying to set the stage up in a way that things are naturally facilitated to go towards, uh, towards all of these interconnections, right? So you make sure there's those third spaces, that parkland, those plazas, um, amphitheaters, whatever it may be, this public space, just by doing that and then centering your businesses around that uh, without controlling any more than that, you're already on a good track to set the stage to a lot of interactions and a lot of community building. Um, and eventually, potentially a lot more power building as you get to know your neighbors. You don't view yourself as a isolated voter. There's still a lot of power in, in the U.S. at the local level. The, 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 the heavy moneyed interests have not gotten their meat hooks in so hard that it's impossible to change even a, a mid-sized city, um, even perhaps a large city. 
um, but definitely a, a mid-sized city, uh, you can still have influence as, as a small working group of, of activists on your local politics. And, and that can shape whether your, your city facilitates community interaction, facilitates giving people a stable platform to, to live their lives in peace and, and free from constant harassment and subjugation, uh, or whether it doesn't do those things. Um, you, can, you can have that power to push things in that direction at the local level. Uh, but again, if everyone just coming into the city and then leaving, it's hard to organize politically as well because you're, you're geographically having to organize a larger geographical area than just a neighborhood. If instead most things happen within your own neighborhood and through that neighborhood network now, people are more aware of the issues that affect their neighborhood that are, that are coming from the, the city level, there's a much better chance that you can uh, form activism in a way that, that you can make the change that you want to see. Um, and this could be something very simple, like I really want to promote food security by allowing people to raise certain animals within the city limits. Um, if you don't have any care about local politics, you may find out just by chance that um, you're not allowed to raise, say, chickens in the city. That happens a lot. Uh, if you just let the politics, the local politics, you know, the chips kind of fall where they may, you may get a bunch of, uh, you know, concerned homeowners or something like that who are like, we don't want the property values to go down, so we're going to ban chickens. And they have all these these notions of, of what makes a good neighborhood, and, and really all they're looking at is the, the value of homes and with the idea that their home is less a home than in a future investment that they will someday cash in on. If you let those people just kind of control things, you're probably going to end up with a bad city, right? So like it or not, you're probably going to have to be involved somewhat in local politics if you want to be able to do the sorts of things that you want to do in your life. And if you wanted to live a permaculture sort of lifestyle, there's a ton of regulations about how you can grow food, where you can grow food, um, you know, where you can sell food, how you can sell food. Uh, what, you know, there's, there's regulations for like, uh, um, if you need food inspection and, and the regulation may be that if you have any additives to your food product, you have to have a commercial kitchen. It has to be inspected regularly by, by the health inspector, so on and so forth. Right. Um, so if you just, if you make like pasta sauce and you add salt, you may, f you may fall under that regulation, but it's important to know about that. Um, not to say that you should necessarily oppose that sort of thing, but just all these regulations affect how you are able to, or not, uh, grow food, um, uh, and do other sorts of, of permaculture activities or just applying permaculture to cities. The zoning code, whether you can have mixed use, that affects how likely you are to have a, a good and vibrant city with that allows all these interactions. If you have segregated uses where you have residential here, commercial there, industrial there, it makes a lot of things a lot more hard. Like, like I mentioned, it makes organizing harder because you're having to organize a larger geographical space. It makes just getting those those first interactions harder because people are having to shuffle from here to there to there. So the, the point being that local politics matter, and especially if you're looking to apply permaculture to anything that you do in your life, there's going to be a lot of regulations and a lot of... Um, that don't even necessarily relate to permaculture itself, but like the zoning too. You may not be able to raise what you want to raise in the city, uh, but the way to change that is to be involved in local politics. So it all kind of feeds on itself too. The more you can organize, the more you can get your city looking more like you want it to. The more it, it is facilitating of community and interactions, the stronger you can be politically. And the inverse is true as well. The, the more you just let things happen as they may, um, the more things can just kind of go off in a terrible direction that, that only serves capital interests. And hopefully you don't want that. So, all right, rant, rant over. Let's, let's continue. That. You know, they, they, they're not predictable. So I want to go back to this list of salient features of cities 
because there was one on this list that I kept thinking should be there and I could not arrive at it. So and I, I do apologize about the quality of the video. Uh, there may be a better quality one out there, but I haven't been able to find it. Uh, but this is the, the highest resolution is, uh, what was that, 380, 320, whatever that is. Uh, 360p. So uh, sorry if you can't read that, but he'll, he'll list them off. So hopefully they'll be comprehensible. Something that's very near and dear to me, and I'm sure to most of you. And in permaculture, we don't impose solutions. We let the design tools arrive, help us arrive right. at them through the design tools. And the thing I couldn't arrive at easily was food production in cities. It didn't seem like an essential function. I mean, there are cities that grow a lot of food, but most food production in cities is very small scale. And so I was looking at this, okay, now why, why didn't I arrive at that as, as an important function? And I do think it's important for many, many reasons. I still think we should be doing food production in cities, but not because it's going to feed lots of people easily and cheaply. And that brings this up, yeah. that land's really expensive in cities and food is really cheap comparatively. So it's hard to make a living. So, you know, unless your food is highly subsidized or you get paid, you know, by somebody else to grow food or something, um, it's really hard to grow inexpensive food in cities. But Not impossible. I, I have toured a, uh, a couple of small backyard greenhouse and they specialize in, in what's known as microgreens. So you take the seeds of, of you know, like a, like a uh, what do you call it? Um, field mix, whatever for, you know, it's got like the dandelion greens. It's got the, the maybe even chard or um, different types of lettuce, all this stuff all together. So they take that sort of thing. They spread out the seeds into to grow trays. And then before it gets to the full leaf size, they harvest it and microgreens sell for a reasonable price in, in uh, they were in Minneapolis. So they're able to make a, a decent living doing that. Well, it's just a small area. Now they found a, a very specific niche that, that had low inputs, low space needs and, and high uh, return. Um, so that's not gonna be possible for everybody, but it definitely is possible, at least for some people. I think really the, the, the purpose though of growing food within the cities is, is there's, it's a fewfold. It's one to facilitate community. So you have a better sense of, of connectedness to your, your local community if the food is grown there as well. You can go look at the, you can literally go look at the farm that it came from or whatever, or the grow operation. Um, number two, it reduces, although it certainly doesn't eliminate the amount of farmland that's needed out in the hinterlands around a major city that's, that's needed to sustain that city. Now, the way we do agriculture now doesn't always apply to that, um, because most people are growing commodity crops like corn and soy, which is not likely going into the nearby cities anyway. It's, it's most likely being sold on the global markets. So that's a bit, it's, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one applicable. But uh, in the future, that definitely may change, especially as, as, as climate change takes a hold and these industrial models start to fail more and more. Um, you may be more reliant on food that, that comes from close by to your major city. And so by growing, a, you know, a portion, even like 10% of the food, that could be 10% less farmland that needs to be used. 10% more land that can be left wild, you know, um, and just develop as, as it does. Um, Strin says, I feel like the answer is to have almost everyone have their own garden. Yeah. And everyone can have, everyone can grow something. I live in an apartment. I don't even have a balcony. I don't have a patio. I'm on like the third floor. Um, I have a little window box that, that I've, I've gotten, uh, I think, three peppers off this year. But it's something. And then in my, my sunny south-facing window, I have a massive passion fruit vine. That's not going to produce for another about year or so. But, but still, eventually, I could get a harvest from it. I've, I've grown mint. You can grow a lot of different herbs and, and every little bit can add up, right? And, and at the very least, it's helping you connect with the food that you eat a lot more on a much more personal level, on a much more emotional level, right? Um, you have a much better idea of what goes into nurturing living things, right? Um, you, uh, you know, I, I mentioned right behind me, uh, that side, yep, back there is, is, is a hibiscus tree. You know, it doesn't take up much space, 
Uh, I haven't yet tried to, but I'm going I'm to look into how to turn the, those blossoms into hibiscus tea. So, hey, maybe one time out of 30, I don't have to go to the store for other tea. I can just grow my own, you know, my tea substitute. It's an herbal tea, I guess. What do you even call it? I don't even know if that's considered an herbal tea because there's no, it doesn't matter. The point is I'm doing a little bit um, and I feel the benefits, even if I don't make a huge impact on the environment, I feel closer to the things that I eat and consume. I have a lot more empathy towards just the living world in general. Um, I think it's a worthwhile thing and it's something that everyone can do, even just a little bit. All right. Uh, yeah, so, so Blachevig says, or at least every community has a garden. Yeah, community gardens, that's a really important one. That's, that's, that's really at that intersection of community organizing, uh, um, you know, care for the land and, and, uh, permaculture as well. So, or it can be at least. And so it's a place where people can meet and interact. It's, it's one of those third spaces where, you know, from the gardens that I've been a part of, maybe it costs you $25 for the season to rent out a, you know, six by 10 plot or something like that. Um, and you'd be surprised how much you can pack into a six by 10 foot plot. But more than that, it's a space where people can meet and, and share ideas and just build their community. You know, it's one of those third way places. So yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Not everyone has to be interested, says Blachevik, uh, but at least knowing that all the people uh, growing your food on a first name basis is still a huge deal. It really is. It's amazing when you, when you, uh, I mean, not the kids necessarily should be blamed for this, but, but a lot of kids that I've encountered don't understand that their food comes from anywhere else than the grocery store. Right? That's the only place they ever see food growing. Or they don't even see it growing. That's the only place where they see food is the grocery store. They assume that's where it comes from. Their, their, their thinking stops. If you can show them a community garden and they can see all that same produce growing in, in you know, naturally, uh, that can be really eye opening and that can really change their perspective about nature and ecosystems and uh, the interdependent nature interdependent nature of, of all humans on their ecosystems. It's a place where ecosystems unfold too. You can see predatory wasps, uh, uh, you know, putting their, their eggs into their, their prey that which helps keeps the pests down and stuff like that. You can see the interplay of like, you know, frogs or toads eating stuff or slugs eating your stuff. Um, it's just a lot more dynamic and real once you, you get out into the, the land and the soil. But it doesn't have to be a big space. It can be a small space and you can still convey that same message. And that's really important, um, especially if you want your kids to really care about environmental issues. You can't just fax and logic your way to getting people to care about stuff. You really can't. You have to show them, really, in my opinion. And uh, the, the beauty of things, the, the way that they interact, the, just the, the wonder of it all. You know, coming together, interacting, and sustaining you as well as as well as uh, itself and other plants and animals, right? Uh, so Strin says that you want to grow fennel. Haven't looked into it, but I love fennel. I love fennel too. It's a fun one to grow. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really fun ones. Uh, borage is another really cool one. It produces these weird, like, kind of. Uh, blue tipped with yellow scent, yellow and black centered flowers. And they've got these little seeds that come off the end. The bumblebees love it, stuff like that. But yeah, fennel is a fun one to grow. Got that, that anise flavor that you can add to, to stuff and you can grow that indoors. No problem. Um, one difficulty that I'm definitely dealing with right now is that if you get an infestation in your small, you know, micro ecosystem, you're not going to have all the, the predatory insects to come in and balance things out necessarily. So I'm dealing with a lot of mealybugs right now, especially it's, it's really attacking my banana tree, which is my oldest plant. Um, really sad about that, but uh, it's, they're getting really infested into just every little nook and cranny. And there's just not the interaction with the wider ecosystem to allow 
the, the natural predators to come in. So I'm having to deal with it myself. And I've been mechanically removing them with like tweezers and stuff because they really get into each little fold. And bananas, if you don't know, are technically a grass. So they grow in layers. Um, they, they have a, st- a stalk. It's not woody or anything. Uh, in fact, I think it's hollow like most grasses. Um, but it just grows in layers so that they get in between all the different layers and you have to just kind of pick them out. You have to peel back the, the skins little by little and it's just been a nightmare. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to use a, a, a chemical uh, deterrent, unfortunately. Otherwise, it's going to probably overrun everything. And we've, we've tried a number of different things to, to try to control them. But that is one drawback to, to having a, a closed micro ecosystem. So... Definitely, the bigger you can make your ecosystem, the more of a chance you're going to sustain things that keep the pests at least at bay in a dynamic equilibrium. Um, yeah, community gardens are a great idea. Uh, so Strin says, I got into the thought of growing some of my own food, so I haven't uh, started yet, but will when I get my own space with a backyard, hopefully sooner rather than later. I, I hope so. Good luck to you. Uh, I want to do lots of gardening. Well, great. I'm glad you're here and hope you're picking up some stuff to, to think about when you actually get to that planning stage of, of your backyard garden. Let's continue on, though. The crops that actually feed us, the grains, the meat and dairy, the big stuff, requires a lot of land. The calorie mm-hmm. crops require a lot of land. I was just talking to a quinoa farmer the other day who said, I'm growing five acres of quinoa and it's not enough. I can't make a living off of it. I need to be growing 10. So. You can grow some calorie crops, but you need big land to do it. The stuff we do grow in cities for the most part are low calorie crops. They're high in phytonutrients, they're great things, Mm -hmm. but a pound of kale only has 150 calories. So if I'm trying to get my 2,000 calories every day out of kale, I need to eat 15 pounds of kale. (laughs) I mean, I love kale. (laughs) Kale's kale's literally a pretty tough way of getting all your calories. I've tried so many times to to get into kale, but you you basically gotta to to blanch it um, or break it down in some way, or else it's just too tough, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, like he says, those those staple crops, the, the your wheat, your corn, um, to a lesser extent potatoes, because you can grow a, a fair amount of potatoes in in say a, a barrel, like an old wine barrel. Uh, but a lot of your staple crops, they tend to need more acreage. So you're never gonna get to the point where a hundred percent of the stuff comes from within a city. But you can grow a lot of good stuff for you. Uh, and that's really the point. Not to do everything, but to do as much as you can, as well as you can. But <laughs> not can eat 15 pounds. So this means that it's really hard to make the argument that you can feed low-income people with urban-grown food because it's expensive. And another reason that it's expensive is that you've got to import everything instead of a closed loop. That's very hard to do on a small piece of urban land except with some very specialized techniques. Yeah, those, those techniques we'll get into later on, things like black soldier flies and other sort of vermicomposting techniques, where you can break down even things like meat, oils, uh, cheese, um, peels, all the stuff that, that, that usually doesn't go into a compost bin. With vermicomposting, you can do it, uh, even on a very small scale, potentially. Uh, although I haven't, I haven't ever seen it in, a, in say, just like within a, an apartment level. Um, I've, I've had worms. I've had a worm bin in the apartment before, and it just breed, it bred too many uh, fruit flies. And so eventually my wife was like, oh, you got to get rid of that thing because I'm killing fruit flies every day, and it's, it's really annoying. Um, having said that, there are still ways you can do it, especially if you have just a little bit of outdoor space, even a balcony, little patio. Then you can start doing a lot more of this stuff yourself. Uh, wicking tubs and barrels are fantastic for small spaces. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely when we're in that vertical space of the cities, we need to think more three-dimensionally. Um, there's something called a growing tower. Let's, let's pull that up real quick. This sort of a thing. And from the actual place, you know, 359 that puts it out of uh, a lot of people's price range, myself included. But you can make your own. I've made my own version of this growing tower out of a wine barrel. 
And the principle of this is, you see, you look at all these different pockets. Let's see if we can get to the different pictures. You see these different pockets? So you have a vertical column of, of soil that has a bunch of different pockets. You grow stuff in each of the pockets, and then you have this tube right in the center, and that is where your compost goes, and then composting worms. That's the reason for the holes. So the compost goes down the central core, and then the worms come through, and uh, they go in and out of those holes, they aerate things for you, uh, as well as leaving some worm castings, which are a great source of fertilizer. So this is an expensive way of doing it. You're definitely going to have to be doing it for a few seasons to, to make back your money on it. But you can do it with, with lower cost materials. You can do this with a bunch of pallets, as, as long as you make sure not to get the, the green treated ones. You can usually see the green tinge of a green treat one. Um, and the reason for that is it, it leaches chemicals out into it. But uh, uh, let's, let's, I can show you that one too, real quick. You can use pallets to, uh, there's not a lot of good pictures of it though. Let's see if we can get a better sense of that. Uh, something like this. Here you go. Even something like that. You can put that up against a wall. And all you have to do is, is seal off the bottom and you got yourself a little uh, growing space. And you do it enough and uh, you can get stuff like this. Let's take a look at this one. This one, you could be utilizing that vertical space as well. Drill some holes in the side and plug it in just like the pockets of the, gr the grow tower. And that way, you take what is, is, you know, a four by four foot space, if it was just in the ground, and you turn that into a much larger section, you have much more surface area, you're maximizing that edge and valuing the marginal. Uh, and if you get it from pallets, especially if you're in a city, I guarantee you there's some people right now on Craigslist who'd be Craigslist who'd be more than happy to give you some pallets for free. And then it's just a matter of, of filling in that central core. And uh, it doesn't have to all be compost either. Um, as we've talked about with things like hugo culture, you can fill a lot of that with just wood um, and, and uh, leaves, you know, a lot of different stuff you can put in the middle there. And then just the top layer and the sides uh, with soil and compost and you could do that same thing that 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 worm tower design where you put that column um, and it doesn't have to be plastic too but you definitely can make it out of just like I've made one out of a PVC before you can just drill holes in it uh, but you can you can make it out of um, you can make it out of wood you can make it out of a, a, a thick piece of bamboo if as long as you drill through each of the segments and then drill holes in the sides and that can be your worm tower um, so there's, there's ways that you can do these sorts of techniques more cheaply uh, within the city still and maximize that three-dimensional space. So uh, vertical farming does sound great, and that's definitely what I want to get into eventually. That's one of my dreams is to do some, some vertical farming combined with aquaponics and turn that into a cafe. That's kind of my dream. Uh, mm -mm -mm. The YouTube channel Gardening with Leon is an old man who breaks down how to use recycled materials to make wicking tubes. Oh, that's cool. So let's uh, check that out for just one second. Uh, we'll get rid of that one. And we'll do, uh, we'll go, go to a permaculture page. I'm sorry, YouTube page. Gardening with Leon. Let's, let's check it out. Cool. <laughs> I like it. All right. So he's got a lot of cool stuff. Farm techniques. And this stuff is all over YouTube. YouTube is a great source for different gardening ideas. Um, I learned a lot about permaculture just through looking through videos. Uh, in fact, why don't, what's this one here? Mm -mm -mm. Uh, let's go back to my home page go back to my channel you can see that real quick this is where you'll find all my archives by the way 
I have a bunch of different playlists. So I usually organize it by book. So you have like the couple essays I just did from David Graeber, Principles of Communism, all in one playlist, stuff like that. And uh, the one that we're working off now is is uh, from one that I, I had streamed on my um, Facebook group's channel, um, LSB TV, which stands for Left Signal Boost TV. So go check that out there as well. Left Signal Boost TV is the page associated with the group uh, Left Signal Boost. Fun place. And I'm going to be getting more and I'll be making more of an announcement about that uh, later on we got exciting stuff coming up with that group. Um, okay, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to put that right into here so you guys can check out this permaculture list of videos that we've been working off in case you've missed anything. And then, of course, you can always look at, uh, back into my archives as well. Um, so my permaculture 101 playlist. I have my first five videos up. Um, and I, I've, I've added to the descriptions so you can see what you're looking at at each one. Um, and kind of see what each one covers. So there's that. But yeah, thanks thanks for all your, your comments, uh, everybody. It's been very helpful. Aquaponics is what you love to do as well, Blatjevig. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Aquaponics is one of those things where I think you really can generate a lot of food in, in relatively little space, especially if you're stacking up your grow beds one on top of another. Um, and then provide not just vegetables, but, but a source of, of animal protein as well, uh, relatively easily. So yeah, I have a bunch more ideas about that that we'll get into in later discussions, uh, especially when I talk about housing. I'm going to try and cover, basically, you know, I, I talk a lot about, um, oh, what is it, like the, the six or seven things that, that are essential to human life. So you have your food. Utilities, so that's everything from, from heat to electricity to internet to water, all that sort of thing. Uh, you have transportation, you have education, healthcare, um, and did I say housing already? I don't know if I did or not, but, but housing is definitely one of them. Uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to take each of those on separately and kind of try and synthesize all my ideas that I've been talking about so far into one sort of a vision for each of those. So I'll take housing, talk about how we can incorporate permaculture as well as leftist, think, leftist thinking into creating housing for people of all different incomes. Do the same thing with transportation, how we can make that work better in a city. To make a, a, you know, the trans, the, especially the mass transportation system of tomorrow. Things like that. So, so look forward to that. Whoops, <laughs> I didn't mean to bump the microphone there. But look forward to that in, in future episodes uh, coming up hopefully soon. Uh, so Blachevig says, I've seen versions of aquaponic systems that actually allow for root vegetables to be grown on. Now that is interesting. I would love to learn more about that because I have not yet seen that in an aquaponic system. But I don't doubt that it's possible. Carrots, potatoes, it's mad science. Yeah, that's really cool. As a southerner, I'd want that uh, with slower growing local delicacies that could be fed more cheaply like catfish or even crawfish absolutely yeah yeah that's that's kind of my vision take uh, things like catfish as well as tilapia the more common fast growing uh, commercially available fish uh, freshwater fish that is but then things like uh, there's these giant river prawns that that come out of i think thailand oh i actually i want to show you this because it's kind of cool I think that's what they're called yeah these things are insane looking um the 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 adult form has these bizarre like slender blue claws but just look how big that is that's almost the size of a lobster um and they're freshwater so you could grow that in an in a aquaponic system in the city and you could have a source of, of you know seafood you market it as prairie lobster or something like that. Um, but then there's there's freshwater mussels. Um, there's a bunch of different freshwater animals that, that could be grown and, and harvested inside of a, a city operation. All right. But yeah, I love catfish and crayfish as well. 
I suppose you call them probably crawfish, pronounce it that way. Either way, I love I love all that sort of thing. Um, and I think it could be done much more in cities. We don't have to look just at, at fruits and vegetables. We can look at, at the whole web of life, not just one not just one kingdom. Usually the soil and the air in cities is pretty toxic, so it translates to not such healthy food. The city boundary is not an ecological unit. In other words, your soil types are not going to match up with where your property lines and other things are, and microclimates and all of that. So it's hard to just say, I'm going to go find some good land in the city to grow food on. It's hard to know. And then one that intrigued me a lot was that we all have heard the story of the 1500 mile salad you know the average salad in the u.s travels 1500 miles ah so blatchevic links are not allowed right in the chat because it's just me i do all the production myself um so i you know if chat was really going it'd be hard and there's been trolls trying to spam junk in the in the chat before and it's just not been good but you can always whisper it to me and uh just let me know that you've done it though if it's in the middle of a stream so i can go look at it and uh and, and share it on your behalf but i'm happy to share things that i think are, are, are good links i just at the same time want to protect the community so that's why i don't allow it directly in the chat eventually too i'm going to get a discord and then we'll be we you know we'll at least have follower or perhaps subby uh links allowed i'm not quite sure how i'm going to do it yet but eventually the goal is to get a discord and then make it easier for for you all to like call in and stuff like that too um as you, as we get to know one another and we we want to have more of a conversation than just over text i think discord is going to be the the next evolution of that uh but at this point i'm, I'm not all that familiar with discord and how it's run so i gotta watch a whole bunch more videos before i, I do actually have a discord i just haven't made it public yet so but I want to be a little bit more confident that it's not going to go off the rails or get trashed by Nazis or, or any of that sort of thing. So that's what's, that's what's holding that back at this point. Uh, so the channel where you saw the root veggie capable system was on YouTube called Learning Organic Gardening at Growing Your Greens. Oh, I love Growing Your Greens. He's a great guy. Uh, let's pull him up. Just real quick. I know it's been a lot of sidetracks. We'll get back to the, the main video pretty soon. But I just want to... Sh growing your greens is... Your greens. And you said it was on... What is aquaponics? Okay. Let's see if we can pull that one up. Yeah, this guy's In great. addition, they got some of my favorite. This is the Shiso or also known as Perilla, and this is the purple shiso. I grow this in my garden every year, and evidently it'll do well under aquaponics in the cinder right here. Check it out. This basically acts like a biofilter here, and uh, this cinder actually, unlike other medias that can be used for the... So, yeah, so so I should, you know what? In fact, I should, uh, I'm going to add, I'll add a bunch of aquaponics stuff to the end of this playlist at some point here, but this would be a good one, too. Uh, uh, let's save that to the on permaculture playlist and there we go. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover this video in more depth later on. This looks pretty good though. I love this guy. He's great. Own food today, you know, especially. Yeah. So growing your greens, another good resource and welcome in bread crochets. Nice to see you. I'll give you a shout out in just a second here or a proper shout out. I should say. Uh, but let's continue on with the video tonight and welcome as well jelly moon nice to see my my emotes being used um yeah this this brings up a, a good point too uh i just kind of selected my my emotes based on you know what i thought was fun or or you know relevant to the channel and stuff like that but if there's any other sort of uh, emotes that you would like uh, i'm always open to suggestions on that sort of thing because uh, uh you know it's really for you guys the the subscribers um, to, to have fun and play around with. So yeah, you got any idea, ideas on that? Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry to say, sorry, you say words and I feel things about some of those words. Okay. No problem. Was was that the, the, uh, the crayfish that, that triggered you or something like that? I apologize. Uh, cinder is the key. 
That's the medium that makes it possible since you can't effectively use soil. Yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff you can use. I have a bag of expanded clay, which is basically just clay pellets, and that provides a lot of surface area for that bacteria to hold on to that then converts the fish waste into the, the usable nutrients in an aquaponic system. But yeah, you, you can't use just regular soil. It gets too bogged down. It, it washes out of the system. So you're right. You have to have something different. Um totally done now okay <laughs> all right well let's let's move on to the video uh for, yeah let's 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 move on from the farm to the table it turns out and so that creates this very charismatic idea this very grabby idea of the food miles concept it turns out that that's not actually a really good leverage point to be working it's a sexy idea and we grab a hold of it but if you actually look at the energy footprint of food production where the energy of producing food comes from or where it's used uh oh it looks like i'm missing a slide Okay, well the numbers are, it's 84% of the energy in growing food is on farm, 4% of it is used to transport it from the farm to the distributor, to the store, to the house. 4%. So you can cut your food miles in half and you're only eliminating 2% of the energy footprint of food. The farm is the place where you've got to work, which is a great argument for small farms, local farms, all sorts of things like that. There are many reasons to grow food in cities you know, create that farm to table connection, get people's hands in the dirt, connect people to the earth. I mean, all, you know, all of these reasons. Um, but those are, those are not essential functions, in other words. So this bothered me. I hate, I hate running into ideas like that, my favorite pet things. You know, like earthworms are an invasive species. I hate that idea, but it's true. Um, so Here's an old city, this is Damascus. You can see there's not much room in there to grow food. Most cities didn't have enough room in them for food until the automobile era and the freeways and the sprawl that happened. Well, it was mostly rich people who could afford gardens in cities. This is the pattern of food production for cities. You get a, a core, a village core, an urban core, and it's surrounded by farmland. And people leave the village, some of them to work in the farms every day, and then they bring the food back in. That's been the pattern for six to 8,000 years, ever since the evolution of cities, really. This is how cities have been fed. And this explains the really baffling license plate of New Jersey, which is the garden state. I mean, I've been in northern New Jersey, and it ain't no garden. Um, no offense to New Jerseyites. Um, the, the state plant is the pharmaceutical plant uh, in, in New Jersey. It's terrible. But, New York City, what explains that license plate is New York City used to be fed by the truck gardens of New Jersey and rural New York and Connecticut up until the 1960s. Most of New York's food came from a fairly small radius around New York City. With the advent of frozen food, refrigerated transportation, uh, really cheap oil so we could move food long distances cheaply, and suburban sprawl that paved over a lot of the farmland, that pattern has changed, but it's the old one and it's one that has made sense for as long as cities have been around. So we may see it again. This also brings up another idea of Jane Jacobs, which is the importance of the city region, the city's connection to the rural area around it. Jacobs showed research that says that the health of a rural area is nowhere near as dependent on things like good soil or climate or adequate rainfall as it is on the vigor of it, the urban area that its surrounds or is near. It's, that's why when Detroit went down, it took a lot of Michigan with it. When Pittsburgh went down, it took a lot of Western Pennsylvania with it because that connection is really important. It's the cities that, that really provide livelihood, um, education, all sorts of things on this really great exchange in a healthy city region is really important. And also if I could engage in some stereotyping for a moment, Cities tend to have more progressive people in them. They tend to be more liberal or more progressive than rural areas. So it's very often the urban folk who are in support of organic food and local food and support your local farms and let's not pave over in the farmland. And you know, it's, it's very often the urbanites who are driving that move to a more sustainable and more regional food system. But also I think there's another really important reason that we need to have this good city region connection and that's because if we don't get out of the city periodically, I think we go insane. I mean, that's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and those people are out of their minds as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that looks nuts. Uh, work there, you got to get out periodically. 
what, what happens to us in cities if we spend too much time or in just purely human environments that have no feedback from nature is we build these giant intellectual edifices of ideas upon ideas upon ideas and there's no feedback with reality. This is why economists who mostly live in cities have been able to come up with the idea of the infinite growth economy. <laughs> Get out into nature a bit and you will see that nothing grows forever except cancer. You know, it, duh, that sort of thing. So that's why I think it's really important to have that city region connection for, for a, yet another reason. Is to keep us sane, to give us feedback with, from something real to make sure we're not just going off on some wild idea that actually has really bad consequences. So I want to move into a little bit of a permaculture toolkit now, just how permaculture can help us do this design without design. And I want to start with the idea of the food shed, which I think most of you are familiar with. Um, if we are going to talk about more local food, having vibrant uh, urban um, city regions, then we want to be able to design healthy food sheds. Right now, the food shed, the area that, that our food comes from, for the average American, is the whole planet, right? Strawberries come from Chile in the wintertime. Apples come from Australia, all these sorts of things in New Zealand. So if we want to shrink our food shed and have it be more localized, the permaculture zone system, which I imagine pretty much everyone here is familiar with, um, really helps us with this. So zone one, if you're living in a city, would be your garden. You try to meet whatever portion of your food needs makes sense from your own garden. And a lot of us, you know, a lot of urban people don't have gardens. That's okay. That it still works. So you may recall, if you've been following along with this this series of, of videos, the the idea of doing zone mapping for your homestead. You know, uh, putting your your highest intense need stuff closest in to your, your homestead, your your house, uh, and then going out from there to zone two, which you'll visit every day. Uh, but not as much as, as your zone one, and then further out, further out, further out. It's, it's a very similar sort of thing. The idea is you want to get as much as possible uh, from that zone one within the city, and then a little bit more, or a little bit uh, less, um, but still a lot, a significant portion from zone two, three, four, five, just like that. The, the main difference is this is much, much more dependent on geography rather than all the other factors that could be at play on your particular homestead. Um, so it's, it's much more about distance rather than things like where the water flows or, or uh, which way the wind blows from, that sort of thing. But yeah, what, so you'd make decisions like, what, what does it make sense for me to grow in my garden? And these would be things like really expensive foods or foods that you eat a lot of or foods that you really like or foods that are really easy to grow in your conditions, there you go. you're probably not going to meet all your food needs in zone one. Mm -hmm. So then we move on to community supported agriculture and community gardens where some of it you're doing yourself and you can certainly see the people who are growing it and talk to them and probably be at the farms, be at the plots of land. So you got lots of control, lots of input, lots of back and forth relationship um, with the people who are growing food. You're still probably not going to meet all your food needs just in those two, so you expand to the farmer's markets, the ones that are you know, primarily local, but they'll import a few things that you can't actually grow around there. You're probably still going to have a few things that you can't, that, that aren't going to meet your food needs, some staples like coffee and chocolate and things like that. Um, so that's when you go to you know, the independent groceries that, that support local farms but do import things. And then, so th that's probably going to meet most of your food needs right there, if not all of them. If you still got a few things that, you know, you really want, that, that's when you sneak into Costco and hope none of your green friends see you there, that sort of thing. I think of, I think of Zone 5 here as, you know, the area least frequently visited that you have very little effect on. That's, that's how we treat Zone 5 is we don't manage it, we don't have effect on it. You know. So someone pointed out at one of Starhawk's classes, and, and no surprise it was there, they said, you know, zones one, two, and three, that's great, but underprivileged people. In Sorry, I just wanted to, to mention before we moved on, the, the, uh, what he said was Starhawk's class, not Stark's. It came up as Stark's in the, in the uh, closed captioning. Starhawk, as you may remember, uh, is, is not only an author who did The Fifth Sacred Thing, which I've mentioned uh, in at least one of these permaculture 
uh, videos, but but also is a permaculture practitioner and, and runs classes as well. I believe she's still doing that now too. But she, she tries to integrate everything from um, ecology to spirituality to a lot of different things into, into her teachings as well. Cities don't get those. They don't have those. Those are missing. And, and I really, you know, the, so the comment was sort of like, this is kind of an elitist attitude towards food a little bit. Yes. And what it points out, and one of the things I love about permaculture's design tools is there's the leverage point. We need zones one, two, and three to be created in those food deserts. That's what we need to be doing to help bring those back, to help, to help eliminate those food deserts. So it identifies the leverage point. And that's why I love porting permaculture's design tools into human systems, because although they were developed for landscape, they work really well for human systems. So a couple of other examples of how we can use the zone system in non-human contexts or sorry, in human, in non-landscape contexts, would be in relationships. Like, who's in your zone one? You know, you're the people you see the most, spouse or partner in your zone one. Then zone two would be people living in your home. Zone three would be your close friends um, and colleagues that you really spend a lot of time with, then casual acquaintances in zone four. Zone five would be people you know, who you see occasionally. You know, that really cool checkout person down at the store whose name you don't know, but you always like to Get in, get in their line because you know you're going to have an enjoyable time. And this helps me think about things like, boy, that person's gotten into my zone two, and they really belong out in my zone four. So, you know, just I, I really love this, this way of conceptualizing things because we're starting to see how you can take these permaculture concepts, even something as, as you know, uh, like uh, physical, as, as like nuts and bolts, um, as, as mapping out how you plan your homestead, this the zone mapping, you can take that and apply it to something that's, that's le a lot less tangible, your social relationships in this case. So that's one of the beauty parts of these, these permaculture techniques is because we're not being dogmatic and saying that, 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 that and, and prescriptive and saying that it has to be applied only in this way and this is the only way to do things and, and it will work every time. No, we can play around with these concepts, bring them into different parts of our lives apply them to different things, see what works. Uh, permaculture really embraces experimentation with, with any sort of technique that we're talking about. I think this is a great way of looking at your relationships. Yeah, that's cool. Helping to understand the impact of the relationships in your life. So there's another use of the zone system. There are tons of them. Um, I <laughs> well, yeah, see, I, I become very childlike when I, when I get indoors. Uh, yeah, ch children living at home. Some children don't live at home is what that means. So a nonprofit, <clears throat> potential roles in a nonprofit, zone one might be the board of directors. Zone two would be staff. Zone three would be the donors. Zone four would be the volunteers. You know, each with a little less power, a little less influence, and then going out to the community served. Although some people in nonprofits would say, no, this is exactly backwards. It's the community served that should be at the center. And maybe, you know, hopefully we hardly ever see the board of directors or that sort of thing. I mean, I would, I would tend to agree more with the latter conception of things, but that's just me. Then one of my favorite examples, this wonderful middle school teacher named Michael Becker, who took a permaculture course up at the Bullock Brothers Farm years ago, was so inspired that he created this completely permaculture-based curriculum for his middle school students. And I could go on for hours about what Michael has done with these students. It's unbelievable. Um, but that's a different talk. And so Michael has studied learning a lot because he's, he's interested in, in how people learn. And one of the things that, that research has shown is that it's really hard to learn when you're not comfortable. If you're nervous, if you're anxious, if you're scared, it's very hard to learn. So he talks about comfort zones in terms of learning. So zone one activities would be things that are very familiar to you, the stuff that you, you know, slam dunk to do, really, really easy. Then zone two would be non-stressful things, but you know they're, they're a little bit new to you, but they're not stressful. And then zone three would be things that you want to do, but they are going to be a challenge, like learning to play a new musical instrument or something. You know it, it's going to be rough at first. You're going to sound terrible, but, you know, but you'll get it, and you want to do it. Then zone four would be things that you don't want to do, but you're being compelled by some force to do them, like your job a lot of the time. <laughs> And then zone five would be things where you would just rather die than do that. <laughs> no way. I'm not going to do it. And Michael tells this great story that I'm going to borrow from him. Well, actually, I'm stealing, I guess, because he doesn't get it back. But um, 
Yeah, he could use it again. It's true. It's like it's like pirated software. So, <laughs> so Michael was very nomadic when he was young, and he uh, traveled all around the world. And his parents were pretty much okay with that, except for one thing: his mother was really bothered by the fact that he was doing his laundry in public laundromats. Just you know, the idea that his clothes were going into a washing machine that somebody else's dirty underwear were in like minutes before. Just, it, it was zone five for her. It was a horrible thing to contemplate for her. So when Michael met the woman that he later married, they fell in love, they decided they would live together, and he understood that the living together piece was also going to be challenging for his mother. So when he made the announcement, he said, Mom, Meg and I are gonna live together, and the house has got a washer and dryer. And mom was so taken by the whole washing machine thing that the living together thing just kind of sailed right past. <laughs> so we can tailor our, living, our, our learning experiences, kind of helping people toward the learning experience that we would like them to have. You know, that's a little manipulative there, but, but you can understand the principle holds. Of we connect a new thing to a familiar thing, and people, people can, can, can learn a lot better that way. All right, so, and there are lots of other ways to use zones in, in human context, but I'll move on to, uh, to sectors, which are influences coming from off the site. Things like, you know, the classic uh, permaculture outdoor sectors like wind and sun and wildlife and fire and flooding and things like that. This is obviously an Australian map because the sunward is to the north. Um, Got to throw in the little Aussie thing a bit. But if you think about human sectors then, moving on from the natural ones. So here's a design by Larry Santoyo, who's a really great designer down in LA. This is in Morro Bay on the coast. And the big sector there, well, there are a couple of them. This is the design after it's done. This is west, and a very cold wind blows lots of the time from the ocean there. The other big sector here is that, you see this house, it's kind of gray behind here, a little hard to see, but that's the neighbor's house. The women who, the two women who lived in this yard lived in this house, liked to garden in a bathing suit or sometimes less when they could. And that was just fine with the guy who lived in this house, who would actually go up to the second floor and sit there while they were out gardening. Really kind of you know, creepy. So when Larry designed this tea house for them to hang out in, a beautiful structure, yes, he put it in the wind corridor, but he also put it in the peeping tom sector as well. So <laughs> really nice stacking of functions here. You know, and really good sector analysis. You know, so we've got the natural sectors, we've got the view sector, we have the all-important neighbor sector in, in urban areas like this. Uh, then we've got other human-oriented sectors, the noises that are made, pollution, homeowners associations, mm. and zoning, really big ones. They dictate Absolutely. what we can and cannot build a lot of the time. Sectors are really, really, really important. And I could tell you many horror stories, as I'm sure anybody who does design work here, of people who did poor sector analysis and missed important sectors, and it just wrecked the whole design. You know, you just suddenly find you're in an unlivable space because you forgot, you know, that it was going to be 106 degrees and you didn't have any shade or something like that. So we just, we, I like the phrase, sectors trump everything. You really want to get your sector analysis right, and the human sectors are really important. If you do really clever design, if you understand your sectors really well, sometimes those unpleasant sectors can be made to just disappear altogether. You can just get them to go away. Um, an example of this is a design by Mark Lakeman of City Repair up in Portland, where he put together a cob bench. It was in a public space. He wanted to build a roof over it because it's Portland and it rains. And as soon as he came up with a design for the roof, the city said, well, you need a permit for a roof that size and a permit's gonna be several thousand dollars. So Mark said, well, what's the biggest roof I can build without a permit? <laughs> and that is the size right there. <laughs> so he just strung them all together. And this also brings up the permaculture principle of the problem is the solution, because that's a more elegant design than having one roof. It's a nice innovative thing. So if you understand your sectors well enough, you can actually make the negative ones just kind of disappear and use them to enhance your design and come up with ideas that you maybe wouldn't have come up with. Then urban sectors, there was a guy in a permaculture course, that one of the very first ones that I co-taught years ago, a guy named Bart Anderson, lives in Palo Alto. Um, he's the, one of the editors of the resilience.org website, great guy. 
But he lives in an apartment. And he said, look, I love zones and sectors and things, but I live in an apartment. I don't even have a yard. But he came up with this sector and zone map where zones are based on the type of transportation you use to get somewhere, walking, cycling, transit, that sort of thing. And then sectors are things like the corporate influence, local businesses, community, churches and clubs, friends and family, those sorts of things. And then he populated this with the various things in his life trying to move as many of the things that he used most often into the inner zones, walking and cycling, and trying to minimize the influences that he didn't want. Like, he realized that the corporate influence right inside his house was television, so let's get rid of television, hmm. and those sorts of things. So a nice way to combine zones and sectors in, in human, human areas. Then the third method that I'll talk about briefly is matching needs to resources, or needs and yields analysis, we often call it, where Make a list of your needs, make a list of your resources, how many of your resources can meet your needs, where can you acquire the other resources to help meet your needs, what do you have in surplus. You know, the idea is to make all these beneficial connections so that you don't have to be buying a lot of stuff. Needs can be met within your design. And, and doesn't that fit quite nicely within any sort of post-capitalist economy, especially if we're even getting past markets and, and stuff like that? That's how the economy is is run at that point. You you tally up the needs of the people for various things, um, all the different things that they need, and then you figure out how you can match those needs. So so an interesting parallel between the two there. So a way to look at this in an urban context is to ask, what do we have a lot of in cities? You know, what's really abundant? An abundant resource: people, lots of buildings. Lots of built material and salvage, couches out at the curb, that sort of thing. There's more money in urban areas than in rural. Lots of jobs in commerce, relatively speaking. And we've seen that there's more innovation. And then we do the same for things that are scarce in cities. We've got land is pretty scarce and expensive. Organic matter is kind of hard to come by. Same with raw material. Ah, it's only hard to come by if you are looking at as only coming from the land and, and not from things like the massive amount of food waste that, that comes out of the food industry, or the, the, the food service industry, I should say. Restaurants, cafes, um, uh, uh, why am I blanking out? Uh, fast food joints, stuff, stuff like that. Massive amounts of food waste comes out of there. So in a certain sense, there's tons of, of way underutilized um, organic matter and uh, especially if you're thinking about things like um, maybe doing a, a food not bombs you could be looking at diverting a bunch of that directly uh, from being thrown away for no reason into helping to uh, feed your local community um, so I, I disagree just just slightly with that materials and then we're busy in cities so it's fine it's hard to come by and then you've got matching them. So buildings are abundant, land is scarce. So you put that together, you use buildings in place of land, and you come up with something like this. This is not Photoshop. That is a design by a, a, a Austrian architect named Hunterwasser, uh, who not only has trees on top, you know, which is OK. People are doing all sorts of rooftop gardens. But he's got special windows the trees are growing out of. <laughs> So this is a nice example of what one of my mentors, Tom Ward, calls ultimate permaculture. He says we have three levels of design in permaculture. There's the, the quick fix, which is like your gutter's leaking, so you stick a bucket under it to catch the water. Then there's the retrofit. And, and we're doing a lot of retrofitting these days because we live in a fairly built environment. It's rare that you get to tear everything down or start with a blank slate and build a big apartment complex. Usually we're dealing with a built space that we have to retrofit. So that would be, you know, you fix the gutter and you redirect the downspout to a place where the water is going to do some good. But you have in your mind the idea of ultimate permaculture, which is to redesign the whole system and tie all the downspouts together and fill cisterns and irrigate your garden and all of that. That's the ultimate permaculture. And that's, I find, a really useful tool because it means it's OK to do quick solutions because we've got the ultimate thing in mind somewhere that we will try and get to one of these days. And that's really interesting that he, that he says that. Uh, I talked earlier about um, wanting to go through the, the, the six needs, six basic needs of humanity one by one. And my one on housing is, is going to look pretty similar to this sort of thing, uh, just to give you kind of a, a taste of what I'm going to be talking about. And then this is, I don't have the, any of this planned out for sure yet. It's, it's going to be in the future. Um, 
But what I want to do is model uh, apartment complex or, or more likely cooperative uh, condo complex around the, con- the permaculture concept of, uh, or technique of a sun catcher. If you remember the sun catcher, it, it basically, you, you shape everything like a U, um, like a flattened U, basically not a curved one necessarily, um, where the, the open part of the U faces towards the sun. So my idea is to do that with an apartment complex and then enclose that into glass uh, so that you can then create a completely unique microclimate, no matter if you're in a cold climate, warm climate, whatever, uh, within that, that courtyard space. So that's just, that's just a little taste of, of what I want to talk about when I get to that point. So in looking at that, whoop, got the same uh, illustration again, excuse me. Um, Move on. Yeah, I got double. Okay, so um, lots of buildings. There's vertical gardening, lettuces just on an old wall. Again, this is retrofitting here. This is not, this is new construction. That's an artist concept of a building in Milan that is now complete, 22 stories tall with full grown trees on it. And this prompted people to think what happens if a branch off of a big tree falls 18 stories down to the ground? And someone wrote an article saying, can we stop drawing trees on top of buildings? Again, we want to arrive at this as a solution, and that's kind of imposing. I mean, it's cool, but... Mm. Oh, wow. So ta- what was that? $27 is rating with a party of 85 <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you so much, $27, for that raid. This is uh, by far the largest <laughs> raid I've ever seen on this particular channel welcome in raiders we are talking about permaculture tonight and we are planning we are uh talking about uh toby hemingway a great uh permaculture uh designer and his application of permaculture principles to cities and city living uh so thank you thank you again 27 dollars. i'm going to shout you out in the the comments everybody please go follow 27 dollars a brilliant leftist streamer um and wow, yeah, this is uh, so many people. Uh, thank you all for the, the follows. I will get to you in just one second by name uh, to thank you each individually for the, the follow. All right. So hopefully that went through right. $27. Everyone go follow $27. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome in James TV, Andy from Ohio. Uh, let's see. Hold on. I gotta get that down. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's see. All the different fathers we've had just now. Man, so many, and they're still going. Thank you for the follow, Mouse Lander, aka HCAP Stock. Thank you for the follow, Late Bloomer 66. Thank you for the follow, Brandy ET, as well as Echo underscore Lou. Thank you for the follow, Mind. Uh, for you, thank you for the follow, Trash Andy420. Thank you for the follow, Andy from Ohio. Thank you for the follow, Effusive Stoicism. Uh, thank you for the follow, Dragon Princess. Thank you for the follow, Chris from AK. Uh, I'm assuming that's Alaska. Uh, thank you for the follow, Gail Goats or Gates. Thank you for the follow, Duchess the 420 Dragon of Texas. Uh, thank you for the follow, Belivion. Uh, one, thank you for the follow, Circuit Overlord, and thank you for the follow, Grimpy Coffee. Thank you all so much for the follows. I am Bread Theory. If you're new to this channel, which I assume you are, um, I cover usually leftist literature. I do the audiobook version. Um, it's been every Wednesday night lately. We're covering State and Revolution every Wednesday night with the For We Are Many uh, podcast. And then on Sundays, I cover different topics. Tonight, we're covering permaculture. So uh, welcome in. I hope you, you like what you see, and I hope you uh, hope to see you in future streams as well. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, please click on my, my icon to make sure that you count towards my followers. Uh, but wow, thank you so much. Very generous. And I'm, I'm getting so many followers now that it's not even keeping up on my, <laughs> my watch list. So I've, if I have missed you so far, I apologize. But thank you for the follow and trauma. Uh, let's see if I can see any more of the follows because I feel like I'm falling behind. 
But anyway, thank you all so much for following. Um, <laughs> it just keeps going. Oh, it's just, it's it's slow and catching up. So I see we're at just at Duchess the 420 Dragon. That's why. Anyway, we'll continue on in the video. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about permaculture or what we're watching, feel free to ask. Um, I'm just going to give it one more second um, because I want to make sure that everyone can hear what uh, Toby has to say. So I think we just got a couple more follows to get through. Yep, there goes Circuit Overlord. Should be just two more, and then we'll get back to the video. So yeah, what were you guys talking about in twenty-seven dollars tonight? What were, what was uh, what was being covered there? All right. Anyway, moving on. I think finally, I think we just have one more follow to get through, and now we should be able to move on in the video without any more. Noise is coming over, although I do appreciate all your follows very much. Uh, so he's talking about, right now he's talking about different ways of designing buildings to accommodate more food growing, basically, within cities. Oh, you're talking about candy. Um, the link to the video, sure, I will put the link to uh, the entire playlist that I'm drawing from right now. Um, let me just go back one second to my channel, and I'll give you the link to all the videos that I use for this series. This is uh, part nine of my series in, in permaculture, so there's a whole bunch more that you can go back and, and check out as well. Um, I'll give you the link to that playlist presently. And paste. There you go. So you can go check out that, and that will also bring you to my YouTube channel where I keep all my stuff archived. Uh, you can check out the other things that I've I've covered in the past as well. All right, you talked about William of Orange Chuds in the UK. Oh, that sounds like a maybe an unpleasant topic, but probably fun to to make fun of. That's cool. You're quite welcome, Andy from Ohio. Yeah, so you guys can go check out these videos on your own. This is a really cool uh, lecture so far. He's brought he's he's trying to apply permaculture principles to city design uh, as well as as bringing some food growing ideas into the city as well to make things just more sustainable, resilient, um, to increase the community interaction and interdependence, all that sort of thing. So it's pretty cool, I, in my opinion. Top gardens are all the rage these days. Lots of living roofs and gardens on top of roofs. Obviously, use that space. If My, my feeling is let's use the land in cities first and then move up to the roofs because it's much more expensive um, and challenging to garden on rooftops. But they're great things to do with many benefits. Then container gardening, you know, here's someone who's just gardening in garbage cans or someone who's taken a 12-inch corrugated culvert and slid it and wrapped it around their spiral staircase and just pour water in at the top and it irrigates it. If you don't even have that much space, we got mobile gardens. Here's someone gardening in shopping carts. Here's a little roll-around garden bed. Here's a pickup truck with a greenhouse on it, yeah. you know? <laughs> so get creative. Uh, again, vertical, you know, stretchy bags full of soil and two liter soda bottles and canvas bags and um, lots and lots of places or aquaponics that Max Myers and other folks are going to talk about a lot. Really useful for very small spaces, concentrated. And if you're unfamiliar with aquaponics, basically what that does is you take two different systems and you put them together in a way that they, their downsides become the benefits for the other. So aquaponics is, is the merger of hydroponics, which is growing any sort of uh, fruit or vegetable or whatever sort of food in an aqueous solution of nutrients, and then um, aquaculture, which is the, the raising of fish for food. So you put those two together, and then the waste food or the waste product of the fish gets circulated into the grow beds. It becomes the fertilizer, the nutrients for... Um, for the, the, the plants who then get a, a basically a free source of nutrition. Um, in hydroponics, you usually have to import all your nutrients in for things to work out. Here, it's ready-made from the fish. So you're putting these two systems together to create benefits for both, basically. Yeah, vertical farms are amazing. I totally agree. agree. And that's one thing in the city is we can do more of this stuff because it may be more resource intensive where you wouldn't be able to do this on a, on a very large scale. But if it's something that you're just managing every day on, say, your balcony or at a local community garden, it's something you can spend more time and even more money and materials on and, and still get a good result from it. Thank you very much for the follow, Rip Shaft. Appreciate it. Um, and, uh, and, and also a lot of these systems 
you wouldn't be able to do and have any sort of mechanization um, that you would need on a large scale farm. But if you're just doing it yourself, again, you get that that benefit of just your own human power because um, you're not managing as big of a space, basically. <laughs> won't, won't for hydroponics. All right, let's continue on. Um, lots of high food production meets protein needs as well. Uh, also, just do an assessment. Where is the land in cities? Who's got it? Community gardens are one source, but also school gardens. If you're a parent or a teacher or a volunteer or a kid, you can participate in school garden programs and get some of the produce. Also, churches, apartment buildings, offices. Oh, and, and, and churches and other places of worship can be a huge resource of underutilized land. Uh, I live just down the block from a church. They have a massive field that's just mowed. Like, it doesn't, it literally doesn't go to anything. Um, I think they had a, a festival one time, but, like, all the food vendors and stuff like that were in the parking lot even. Like, they didn't even use the space then very much. And... This is all untaxed land because, well, at least in the U.S., because of the, the legal code, you don't tax um, religious properties. So think of all that land that for, for ultimately very cheap, you could convert into places that, that grow food. And it'd be one more place that communities could come together and meet each other. Um, and, you know, it, it, because it's tax-free land, you get a lot more benefit out of it versus the dollars that you're putting into it. So one more resource you can think about in your local area if you're in a city. Google actually now has a, I can't remember the job title, it's you know manager of horticultural services or something like that, in charge of their employee supported agriculture. Pepsi has a similar position. A lot of businesses are doing employee supported agriculture. Churches, their mission is to, is to support their community. So they often have land and it's become community gardens a lot more. A couple of permaculture principles with some really cool uh, applications in urban settings. Um, this is the work of Mark Lakeman in City Repair and some of the tremendous work he's done. Um, I'm going to really compress this story. It's a, it can be a longer and really beautiful story, but in the interest of, um, of keeping this brief. So Mark and his neighbors you know, lived on an intersection. This isn't it, but it kind of felt like this, this sterile place that you know, was designed for cars. And they had this idea of, well, first they wanted to slow down traffic. They wanted a traffic circle. But the city told them to get a traffic circle, you'd either pay $10,000 and they would build it, or if there was a fatality at the intersection, they would build it for you. Oh. So they kind of looked for volunteers. But oh. So as they were thinking about this, they thought, all right, we're just going to paint a traffic circle. No, we're just going to do it ourselves. And as they started thinking about... Bleep Bon... Uh, excuse me. Andy from Ohio says, Bleep Blomp Ben, I always have trouble with that name for some reason, has made a video on YouTube about grants. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, there's potentially hundreds, thousands of dollars out there that is just laying on the table for community groups to utilize to do things like make their, their roadways safer or, or put in rain gardens or put in community gardens. Um, it, it all depends on how things have been allocated uh, over the years. But yeah, Bleep Bump Ben is a, a fantastic uh, streamer, does great YouTube videos as well. So definitely check out his stuff as well painting the traffic circle they came up with this idea the four neighbors of maybe they could put stuff on each corner you know build uh, an information kiosk and build a free box and library bin and build a children's playstation and then and a little coffee station as well so they built a model they made plans and built a model and took this model into the city the dot the department of transportation and said we want to do this and the city just you know no one's ever done that before, you, so <laughs> you can't do it. Well, there's no permit for it, so you can't do it. It's public property, so you can't use it. Um, <clears throat> you know, that sort of story. But fortunately, there was someone in the DOT at a different desk who overheard this conversation. This is also another instance where uh, what's, what's known as tactical urbanism, a.k.a. guerrilla urbanism, can come into play. Where, where you just do it then. Like you have this idea, you get together with, with your neighbors, usually on a weekend, so there's less enforcement out and you know people in offices that can get mad about what you're doing and you just do whatever the thing is. And usually the city's not gonna go out of its way to you know, come down on a neighborhood for making an intersection better, even if it's not technically within the, the bounds of things. So it, it's, it's the idea of asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, 
So this this may be something that you could have just, you know, this group could have just done on their own without with the help of the city. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, he, follow, he actually followed them out to the elevator, rode down the elevator with them and said, I love this idea and I can't give you a permit for that, but I write the city's block party permits. So if you closed off both streets for the weekend and held a block party, there you go. and if something happened, <laughs> And so that was the idea, better to... Now, now, there's a city official who's really serving his community. That doesn't always work that way, though. So just keep that in mind. If you have some idea of, of, of making some part of your city better, even if it's like, you know, feeding people in a park or something, oftentimes it's better just to, to get together with neighbors, work out a good plan, and then just do it. You know, maybe ask permission if you, if you really want to, but sometimes it's best to just go ahead. And, and, you know, dare them to, to take you down for it. Because that would be bad blowback for them as well. You know, uh, local um, planning board comes down on, on neighbors who are just painting an intersection and making it more livable. That doesn't look good for the city. So you, you have public relations on your side at that point. And so Andy from Ohio says, and taking the money to do hydroponic or aquaponic gardens or something for the community. Yeah, yeah, there's... Any number of things you could do to, to make your community better. And like I said, sometimes it's better just to, to do it and, and hope either nobody notices, because that's another thing. Uh, city departments tend to be pretty stretched when it comes to inspections. So as long as your neighbors aren't making a big scene about it and calling it, you know, as long as they're in on it together with you, that's one good reason to get buy-in with your neighbors. Uh, there's a good chance that no one's just even going to notice and it's just going to become part of the, the fabric that happened uh, not too recent or not too far back with um, the signage around uh, one of the, the most popular city lakes in Minneapolis. I'm, I'm from Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, someone, some neighborhood group just decided to change them back to the native American name, which is Bidet Makaska. And it created such a buzz that they would do that. Uh, that eventually the parks board just made that the, n the name of the, the lake again. They, they changed it back to Bidet Makaska, changing it back from Calhoun, which was a horrible racist. Uh, I think it was somehow instrumental in the Trail of Tears. Not a great guy. Had nothing to do with Minnesota either. They just named it after him for some bizarre reason. So they changed it back to the native name, and uh, it, it stuck. People got on board with this idea and eventually it became the law to the point where the post office went and changed all the, the names for their route as well. And all the official records of property deeds were converted to the new name. Um, a small thing, but it's just something that people did because they saw the need and they, they filled it. So I thought that was kind of cool. So the topic tonight is uh, applying permaculture principles and ethics and ideas and techniques to city design, community design, and, uh, and also growing more food within the city bounds with the idea of lessening the need to disturb and, and uh, despoil the, the countryside, right? So, so every bit of, of produce that's grown within the city is a little bit less acreage that needs to, to be cultivated out in the wildlands, make them remain wild, that sort of thing. Cool, I'm glad you like it. We ask forgiveness then permission. So that's what they yeah, did. So, so. Uh, so they closed off the streets, they had a huge party. All the neighbors came, a lot of the other folks came, painted the traffic circle. This was really smart. They were going to build a bunch of structures out in public, really cool little structures, and they knew they're pattern literate, that it's a city, they're going to get vandalized. You know, someone's going to trash them, of course. So they recruited the um, future vandals, <clears throat> the <laughs> 9 to 14 year old boys in the neighborhood, to help them build. They got them involved in the project, and these kids became the champions of this project. They're now big, they've grown. So they, you know, they're capable of defending this. You don't, you don't mess with this stuff. So here's the library, library shelves and the produce station. Here's the, the uh, tea and coffee station. And it's still there 12 years later. That's when this was built about 12 years ago. And I was there a couple weeks ago and there was a thermos of hot water chained to the post with a bunch of old mugs sitting there. And you could make coffee for yourself or tea every morning. 
And then here's the children's PlayStation. And there it is from one of the rooftops. And this is not street paint. They couldn't use street paint, so it wears out every year. So they just have another big party and repaint it and redesign it and have a really great time there. And this, so this is a small thing, just painting the traffic circle is how it got started. But um, so when they built this. And I'll, I'll say one more thing about the idea of, of slowing down roads. One thing that, that has been shown time and time again to slow drivers down is to put a lot of visual information in their periphery. So as they're going through, if you have cars that are, are you know, it's, it's relatively narrow roads, you have cars on either side. Um, if you have shops that are, are really close by, trees, or things like paint on the road. All these things require you to, to take a little bit of time to process mentally, so just naturally it slows things down. So, so employing all these different colors, lines, breaking up the, the straightaways and that sort of thing, even if people don't treat it as a, as a traffic circle and you know, go around the entire circle, just the mental processing that, that it takes is going to, to make them slow down naturally. It's, it's, it's uh, more effective than just you know, posting a, a lower speed limit or having you know, law enforcement trying to, to stop speeders or that sort of thing. Best thing you can do, put a lot of information to slow people's brains down so that they go slower. Someone from the DOT drove through it a couple days later and looked at it, just freaked out, <laughs> and said, we're going to sandblast this, and we're going to charge it for it, and we're going to tear everything down and charge it for taking it to the dump. Fortunately, some of the neighbors had lived there long enough that they knew how to get a hold of the mayor, and they brought the mayor in, and she was this really progressive woman named Vera Katz who looked at it and said, well, let me get this straight. You're slowing down traffic. You're creating community. you got a presence on the street. You're probably reducing crime because there are people on the street probably increasing property values because it's really cool, probably reducing insurance costs because there's less crime on the street. She said, these are all amenities, all values that Portland subscribes to. You can mm. do this anywhere you want. There you go. So there is now an intersection repair ordinance in Portland and getting to be in a number of other cities. Here are some of the other ones that were built. This was where the neighbor here, the only absentee landlord of this business, wouldn't allow them to do it, so they did it in chalk instead. <laughs> um, and there are now at least 35 in Portland, and LA's got some, Sebastopol had one done, uh, Eugene's got some, Seattle's got some, Denver's got some, they're all over the place now. So Oakland's got them, that's right. <laughs> you know, what was funny is I was doing the research for the Permaculture City. There was a group of cities, there's every time I- Thank you for the follow, Marcus for Left Flank Vets. Ah, Marcus for Left, are, are you the Marcus from Left Flank Vets? That, that's cool, I really enjoy your channel and what I've seen from it as well, if, if that is the case. Um, so yeah, welcome in. We're talking about permaculture and applying it to urban design and community uh, cohesion and interdependence, as as well as uh, you know, growing food as well. Although right now we're focusing on community design. I would Google permaculture, you know, urban chickens or permaculture, whatever, you know, community building or social justice or something. Portland and Oakland were at the top of the list, and then De Detroit and Pittsburgh were the other two cities because. They, well, Oakland does too, but Portland and, I mean, uh, Detroit and, and Pittsburgh are, you know, are dying cities, so they, they need those innov innovations now. But yeah, it was just interesting to see over and over. And the last one on the list, the, the other most common one was Jamaica Plain outside of Boston, and a bunch of really interesting things. But it's just interesting to see the same cities coming up over and over and over again. Okay, those are cool places. <laughs> All right, and another permaculture principle, and someone here is going to talk about this, I understand, over the weekend, which is really cool, is start small and grow by chunking, or don't bite it all off at once. Do something small. If you don't know how to do it, try something small, you know, design a new... So, so again, we have the idea of, of the permaculture principle of small and slow solutions. Uh, and, and this works really well with incremental development in cities where you, you start with something small. As you said, you're not going to know all the factors that are going to affect it going in. Uh, so you just try a little experiment. You see how it goes. If people respond in a positive way, you keep doing more of it little by little. If they don't really get it or it doesn't have your desired results, you tweak it and you try it again. But instead of getting way out ahead of yourself and doing these, these big projects all at once that cities often these days like to do, like big developments all at the same time. Instead of doing that, you're, thing, you're letting things grow more organically and you're responding to the change as it comes in, which is another permaculture principle. Um, uh, creatively respond and adapt to change. 
two guild or whatever it is and get successful on a small scale and then replicate it with variations around it and learn a little more each time and gradually it'll get big and you, you just build, you grow by chunks, by chunking. You put chunks together and you make something big. And this was, so Oakland, like many other cities, has food deserts in it, places where there's no food or no, nothing but fast food within a quarter mile. And these folks in Oakland thought, well, we want to help cure our food desert. So they actually spoke to some of the grocery stores, tried to ask them to come in, and, and the stores, you know, the chains all said, nah, you know, we're not interested in that market. And so they wound up, well, first their idea was to build a grocery store, you know, and then they realized, well, we've never run a store, and we don't have any money, we don't have any capital, so how are we going to do this? So instead they got a used delivery truck and painted it and created the mobile market where they picked up a bunch of produce and they will drive around to community centers and senior centers and other places where people gather and sell produce off the truck. And this was so popular that a whole bunch of places in the neighborhood where there were vacant lots um, are, gr are growing produce. There are 14 at least different gardens now that grow produce for the mobile market. Um, they've expanded, they've continued, they've been going on for a number of years now, and now they have the money to actually do a storefront, the People's Grocery, which is underway. <coughs> so that's, that's growing by chunking, you know, when you're limited by financial capital and things like that and experience. And speaking of which, so how do we, how do we get around the money thing? You know, how do, we, how do we make money a less important part of our lives? These two guys on the East Coast, Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landua, um, inspired by some of John Young's work on, with the Eight Shields program, have come up with uh, eight forms of capital. We all know about financial capital, and because of Jane Jacobs, we know about social capital. But there's also material capital, uh, the built environment or the tools you own and that sort of thing, your physical, your, your, the built, built stuff you have. There's living capital, plants, animals, soil, the life that, that supports us. You build that capital up and it supports you. Cultural capital, the wisdom and, and accumulation over the generations of your own culture and how that supports you and what it yields to you and what you give to it. Experiential capital, the lessons you've learned in life, the things that you you know, that have given you wisdom and skills in life. Intellectual capital, the brain stuff that you know um, and the support that gives you. And then spiritual capital, the grounding and support that gives you and social capital. And all of these together really support you and greatly reduce your need for financial capital. And they're more stable, all of them, than financial capital. You know, who knows what Wall Street is up to? But I know what my friends are up to, and I know what the plants and animals are up to, and I know what my culture is up to, you know. So these are, these are much more stable source, sources of support, and together they form this really great reinforcing web work that greatly reduces your reliance on money. You can reduce the need to earn this way. Uh, their website is 8forms.org, the numeral 8 forms, and they have a book, and they've got a bunch of cool things on their website showing you how to apply these ideas. It's really, it's really terrific stuff. So a nice example of using these other forms of capital is a place that I've done some teaching and work. Uh, a guy named Adam Brock um, is the, the director of the Grow House. But it's, it was a wealthy um, developer in Denver who'd made a lot of money making fancy restaurants, decided it was time to give something back to the community. He bought this set of five abandoned greenhouses that's in an industrial, kind of in former, a former industrial wasteland, um, very underprivileged area of toxic soil, um, and he converted them to food production or established this nonprofit that then did this. So they're growing, they have a huge aquaponics operation along with some, some other types of growing operations, producing a huge amount of food. A lot of the food goes into this farmer's market that's in the front of the buildings. They also do provide some for sale to, um, to other farmer's markets and restaurants, but a whole bunch of it goes to their storefront, which is a pay what you can store for the neighbors, for this, this um, underprivileged, um, ethnically very diverse, many different languages spoken in this neighborhood, um, people of many different colors living there. And it's not only a place to get food, though. It's become a job training center, an education center. A lot of the neighbors work in this place. It's where you can find out about programs that you qualify for. It's become the neighborhood hub, and it's developing a whole set of these other forms of capital for the neighborhood. And it's really enlivening this once really blighted neighborhood. So 
that's a very nice example. Um, other cool projects, and many of you know Pathways to Resilience and Planning Justice. Um, I know Pandora's going to be up here, and, and great, great folks, um, Gavin Raiders, and lots of other wonderful people working with formerly incarcerated people out of, out of Q, out of San Quentin, uh, and other you know, ser really serious prisons, um, providing them with a permaculture design course and specialized education to get them back out in the world. The recidivism rate here is vastly lower for these people. Um, once they've gone through this program than it is for typical ex-con. So um, it's tremendously successful in inspiring programs. And I'm really, really honored to know some of these folks. Um, in my town of Sebastopol, Eric Olson got together with the city and helped design, um, and Eric will be up here, the uh, set of four different gardens, a native and native use garden, uh, a um, pioneer and immigrant era garden, a Luther Burbank garden, because that's where he's from, and a more permacultural food forest garden that's at City Hall and the library out in public, funded by the city, built mostly by volunteers, a really terrific project that's about two to three years old now and is really, really coming along. Another great public project that's gotten a lot of press um, is the Beacon Hill Food Forest in Seattle, mm -hmm. billed as the largest public food forest in the nation. It may or may not be, but it's a really great project. Uh, came out of a permaculture design course, was one of the design projects. And the people were so fired up by it that they decided, let's, let's make it real. Let's really do it. So they got permission from the city eventually to take two acres at a park on Beacon Hill, which is, again, a very diverse neighborhood. And they did huge amounts of community outreach. There was a Samoan soccer team that played there every Saturday. So they talked to them. What would make this desirable to you? What kind of plants do you want? They went to the various Asian communities nearby, all the different communities nearby, and talked with them and said, how can we make this feel like your park? What can we do? When they started having public meetings, the biggest objection that everyone raised was, what happens if someone steals all the fruit? <laughs> and Jenny said, that'd be great, because it shows we need more of them. But also, that's not the problem. The problem is the fruit rots on the ground. People don't know about harvesting fruit. Uh, someone else said, what if some homeless people set up a camp and harvest all the fruit and start selling it? And it's like, well, that'd be sort of cool, wouldn't it, actually? <laughs> But they were, they're actually very responsive and very sensitive to comments and neighbors' feelings and, and really got a lot of buy-in on it, did that people piece in a really, really skillful way. If you don't want to tackle dealing with the city in a big public project... So before we move on from that, just, just think if we use that sort of a, a Beacon Hill model for our, your average city park. And instead of just ornamental trees, we had trees that, that followed the permaculture principles of like stacking functions performing more than one function at the same time and actually had some food that, that grew on them as well. What if we planned all our parks that way? What if we took some of those urban golf courses, which is a really big waste of land, in my opinion, especially um, like the ones I see around Minneapolis, St. Paul, right in the center of, of, of neighborhoods that otherwise could be, you know, enjoying that land for, for many purposes, but it's reduced to just one, which is golfing for the rich and well-connected. What if we took over at least the public golf courses and converted them into food forests? Um, so uh, more than just uh, providing a little bit of food, like you see that that post floating around, like like uh, Twitter, Facebook, stuff like that, where oh, what if we planted the the, the street trees with with fruit and and stuff like that? Well, this is taking it a step further and taking land that's only used for one thing and using it for potentially many more things that could be a center of community gathering. Like, I mean, think of all the, I mean, just think of all the things that he said that the, the Beacon Hill food forest is used for. And that doesn't have to stop there. It could be uh, a place for any number of neighborhood gatherings. It could be a place where uh, you set up, like, a, like I've mentioned, a, a Food Not Bombs chapter. You know, yeah, abolish golf. I can, I can agree with that one for sure. Um, and this is stuff that's already in people's neighborhoods. This is land that's, that's mostly just sod, which only serves a singular purpose that's not open to everybody. Why not open it up to everybody? And at the same time, provide a little bit more food to people that, that need it. You know, he says the biggest problem is food that rots on the ground. Well, I mean, that's easily solved by, you know, holding teachings about, you know, how do you know when this food's ripe? How do you know when that food's ripe? How do you know when it's safe to eat this sort of food or that sort of food? I just food identification. Um, that sort of stuff could happen. 
uh, we could really transform these these way underutilized spaces into something that's for the entire community, especially with min, you, uh, excuse me municipal golf courses, ones that are owned and run by the city. Um, there's a, a, a big push to turn the Lake Hiawatha Golf Course in Minneapolis into a food forest. Uh, hasn't really gone anywhere. There's, there's been a lot of pushback because... Uh, people are like, oh, this is the first golf course that was racially integrated, so it has a lot of, you know, historical value and, and it's accessible to lower income people and all this stuff, which all of that may be true, but it also floods every year. It also costs the city a whole lot more to, to maintain it as a golf course than it would if they, you know, let it flood, planted part of it in, say, wild rice or something like that. Uh, the rest of it in, in, in various food trees and, and bushes and you know, any number of things. Um, you could still be serving those same goals of helping the, the underserved, the underprivileged, uh, facilitating community connections, uh, but also have it usable by the entirety of your local populace, not just the, the lucky few. Because, like, even saying that it's, it's you know, access for the underprivileged, it's not, it's going to cost like five, ten dollars for a round of golf. And if you do it on any regular basis, that can add up. Golf is a really expensive hobby to have, no matter way, which way you slice it. So you're definitely not serving all of the underserved by making it just more an affordable golf course or whatever. You could be doing a lot more by making it a, a food forest. Well, let's take a look at some of the comments here. Uh, so Spider... Oh man, that's a difficult name. Spider Deer? Spider Deer? I don't know. Uh, I live next to a golf course that bought the local park to convert it into a driveway. into Like a, like a driving range, is that what you're talking about? That's so sad. That's so sad. Uh, yeah, the idea that it could be food. And it's not as though it has to provide all of the food for people. The idea is just to produce a portion of it. So you're giving people much more direct connection to the land that, that they are dependent on. You have a teaching opportunity for children to see literally where food comes from, not just a grocery store. Uh, you have opportunities for neighbors to meet each other, especially people from all different classes, because if it's open to everyone, that means everyone can be there, including homeless people. Uh, you can get to know those people as well. They're real human beings. Um, all these sorts of things can happen just by opening it up to various uses that, that also happen to provide a little bit of the basic necessities for people in the, in the form of food. Uh, let's see. Marcus says, put a plaque on the door about it being there first to, uh, desegregate. Yeah, you can, you can put up monuments to these. And these are still probably historically important things that occurred in that golf course. But I just saw a lot of, uh, misguided liberals who had out on their, on their front lawns, like save our Hiawatha golf course, all this stuff. Um, and, uh, it was a shame that they just couldn't see beyond that. To, to what it could be and how it could serve everybody. And, I mean, it literally has a fence all the way around it. You can't even walk on there. You can't, I mean, in, in some places where the vines are thick enough, you can't even see it. So it, it literally serves no purpose to probably 90 or so percent of the people that, that live around it. It's just kind of ridiculous. Uh, oh, no to a driveway for the golf course. Parking lot. Oh, that's even worse. They're taking over a park for a parking lot. That's just a shame. That's just a shame. Um, yeah, like there's tons of acreage within probably every major city that has been taken over by these these elitists who just want to have their their old boys club and and you know uh, do business deals over rounds of golf and stuff like that. And really, that that land belongs in the hands of the the local people. And uh, yeah, I just keep saying it, but you could do so much more with it. So, but we're almost done with this video. I'd really like to, to finish up by about 930 my time. So we're going to, we're going to keep going through for a little ways here. Um, here's Mark Lakeman's office in Portland, which is a public food forest. He just got all this amazing food all over his office on 12th Avenue, which is a really busy street. So tons and tons of traffic. And then a little more locally, two projects that came out of a couple of my permaculture courses in Petaluma that, are, that I'm just delighted to see. Um, see, in a lot of PDCs, a lot of permaculture courses, the design projects never get built or they're, they're pretty small scale and not for the public. They're like somebody's backyard or these sorts of things. Uh, not, I just want to pause just briefly because that, that is one of 
been one of my disappointments, I'll say, more than anything. It's not really a gripe with the way that permaculture is done, but it's, it's been a disappointment. When I went through my permaculture design course, everyone had all these great ideas about, about how to apply it, you know, what to, you know, even forming businesses or whatever with it, or just using it in their own personal life. But then we just kind of all went our separate la- ways when the course was done. We had all this great community, all this great interaction of ideas and, and just, you know, sharing of our lives with one another. And then it just kind of dissipated once the the reason for us getting together was done. And I'm like, what a waste. What I mean, one of the principles of, of permaculture is to catch and store energy. And one of that is is this idea, this this uh, energy that's embodied in ideas and excitement and and wanting to make change in your world. I think permaculture needs to do better, especially the ones that the people that do permaculture courses need to do better to help facilitate that after the class interactions even if it's like you know every week or or every month or whatever we get together with all the alumni and we meet in a cafe and we talk about our lives whatever we watch a movie whatever it doesn't have to be anything super important or specific but just keeping all the people interacting just naturally is going to form those synergies again that you going to get some real good ideas together and 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 really have the time to flesh things out because that's the other thing once you've just had all of this stuff pushed into your head through a permaculture course there's a lot you still got to process there's a lot you really got to you know try and apply to your world as it as it functions uh in reality um and that takes time that takes time that's that you're not really going to have time to stop and really consider necessarily well, the course is, is ongoing, even if you have a year long course, which some of them are year round. Um, it still takes time to really integrate those ideas into your life. So there really needs to be some way to to keep people together once they've they've gotten those ideas in their head and they're going in a good direction. Um, yeah, just my little little bit there. And a group of, of teachers kind of got together and said, let's let's make it so these projects are going to be more real and that they get done and that they serve the community. So I insist in my courses that there be a community component. You know, you need to have the regular old food and land and water and, you know, energy and all those components. But there needs to be a community component and there needs to be a livelihood component. It has to either pay for itself or support the people who are there, somehow fund itself, not just be dependent on grants or rich people or whatever. Um, and so one of the projects that came out of one of my courses is the Francisco Reservoir in the city, in San Francisco, which was an abandoned reservoir that's been sitting there since like the 50s or something, abandoned for a really long time, because no one can agree on what to do with it, and the water department owns it, and it's worth like $50 million, so they don't, you know, they want to sell it, um, but it's just, all this politics has left it just abandoned and ugly, and obviously a very prime site in San Francisco. and. So this design group came up with an idea for it. They, again, did community outreach, talked to people in the neighborhood, got a bunch of ideas from the neighborhood, worked together, created this plan, presented it to the neighbors. One of the neighbors knew the city commissioner um, or the, uh, the city supervisor in San Francisco. So they got a meeting with the city supervisor who loved it, who took him into the mayor's office. They got a meeting with the mayor of San Francisco who also liked it. They started pulling strings. They started talking to people. The water bureau, the water department said, well, Okay, we'll sell it for twenty million instead of fifty million. Eventually, they came down and deeded it for a dollar to the parks department. So this is now underway. It's going to be modified because it's you know city politics and all that. Sure. But some of the essential features are going to be preserved. So this this came out of a permaculture design course. It's really cool. So so that's more what I'm talking about. That that's holding on to that energy and and making a real push towards something real after the course has, has gone on. So that, that's awesome that they were able to do that. Of course, you have to have the, the extra time to like go to meetings and, and, and stuff like that and the means to go do it. So it's not going to be, it's not always going to look like that sort of a, a, a plan that you're going to present to a city, but it doesn't matter what the scale is either. Just so that you're keeping on going, keeping that energy alive and, and keeping these ideas alive so that they don't just, you know, not just something you look back on fondly in, in five years, but haven't really done anything with. And then another one, I don't know why this graphic isn't showing up, but um, you've all seen Petaluma, many of you. Petaluma when it floods, when it rains, so I had a picture of, you know, flooding in Petaluma. Um, My PDC in Petaluma a couple years ago, the vice mayor of Petaluma took it, um, Tiffany Renee, and she knew that the city had to come up with a new stormwater management plan 
because of these flood problems. And the city was starting to come up with just your basic, well, let's build bigger pipes. You know, let's drain it into the bay even faster. So this design group came up with a proposal with all of permaculture's great you know, water management ideas. And this is my little nod towards drought right now. This talk doesn't talk about drought. I actually have a separate 90-minute presentation on rethinking drought. Um, but I'll mention the word drought, <coughs> bing, because it's important right now. Uh, but this, this plan, the new plan that the design group came up with has infiltration basins and rain gardens and curb cuts and swales and you know the whole gamut of permaculture methods for dealing with water and for getting it into the soil instead of treating it as waste um, and micro-remediation and all sorts of things like that. And the city is beginning to implement portions of it. It has become a part of their new stormwater management plan. So another one coming out of a PDC. Really, it's really fun. It just makes me so happy to see this real world stuff that's going to affect lots of people. Um, many of us in permaculture, the idea, something that's really a part at, at deep in our hearts is to re-indigenate, is to become part you know, part of the land to really understand a piece of land, to understand our area and our culture. And we do that by kind of going around the permaculture flower and meeting needs for food, for water, for shelter, for energy, for community, for waste, for health, for all of the basic human needs. Uh, and it turns out that the same skill set that you need to do that on a piece of land are exactly the skill set that disaster relief, that first responders need. So permaculturists are acting as first responders all over the world now. I mean, it really first started to happen, as far as I know, at Hurricane Katrina. Um, but in Haiti, in Nepal, uh, in Japan, in many, many other places that have been hit with disasters, permaculturists are among the first to show up. And I had a participant in one of my classes a few years ago who understood this. And he had worked for USAID uh, in Kazakhstan, building, designing, and building refugee camps back after the collapse of the Soviet Union. and. Um, Refugee camps are hell holes. They're horrible places, mostly. And he said if he had taken a PDC before he designed these camps, they would have been totally different. And he's gotten back into it. Um, <clears throat> he asked me, how long does the average refugee, do I think, live in a refugee camp? It's seven years. They don't just pop in and out. It's seven years. Many of them spend their whole lives there. So they need to be better places to live. Okay, the last little bit then, the famous Hubbard's curve, peak oil and all that stuff, um, since we're talking transition. So it, mo I think all of you are familiar with this, but it's just the idea that the area under the curve is all the petroleum liquids on the planet, and we've used roughly half, and we're pretty much at peak production. And, and uh, I'll just point out, this, this idea, this, this, this was a talk from back in 2015, so since that time, this idea has has been shown to not really be ultimately true like like definitely oil is a finite resource we will get to the peak at some point but through things like fracking and and other um, uh, novel ways of, of getting energy out we've managed to stave off the, the the effects of peak oil so this this is a little bit outdated part of the presentation um, but still something that that maybe we should think about because someday it will happen petroleum products uh, we are burning through them faster, no matter what the form, faster than uh, uh, than they're being produced. Um, I think at last count, it was something like 30,000 years of petro petroleum products we're burning through uh, every year. So it takes 30,000 years to to produce what we burn through each year. Um, and also things have, you know, the, the, the oil demand has, has leveled off and gone down in, in a lot of places too. So it's, it's not exactly what he's talking about right here. You don't have to be all doomer about it, but it's still something to think about. And no matter what, it's better to live in a world where we don't have to depend on petroleum products. It's less pollution. It's less exploitation of, of very poor people. Um, and it's just, it's better living all around. So some of the ideas are still applicable, even if the, the, the uh, predictions ultimately haven't come true yet. Conventional oil production in the world has been flat since 2005. The really, really expensive and dangerous and environmentally disastrous um, non-conventional oils are the only things that have been going up. And most of that's been done by just printing money like mad to pay for it. And someday those bills will come due. It's not economically viable. 
But so we're going to be looking at coming down the far side, and that's going to be very interesting. It's part of why I want to live to be a really, really, really old man is because I want to see how this plays out. It's going to be really oh, interesting. And that's, that's really tragic that he put that in there because I think it was just a year or two later, he actually uh, passed away suddenly. So unfortunately, he, uh, Toby Hemingway, uh, really great permaculturist, author of Guy's Garden and the Permaculture City, which this talk is based on quite the loss to the permaculture community because he was in, uh, I think he was just in his 50s when he when he passed away. Um, so that, that's real tragic to hear him say that. Interesting. Yeah. There'll be some good places, there'll be some terrible places. I want to be in one of the good places and I want to help create more of the good places. You know, it's a patchy universe, right? It's a patchy, patchy planet. There will be good places, so let's make more of those. So this ties into some ideas of various people looking at the nation state, which is the principal form of governance for the last couple centuries. It's really a new, a new kid on the block. The, the, for thousands and thousands of years, there were two principal forms of government. There was either the empire or two forms of state. There was the empire and there was the city state. The nation state, although there, there are a few old ones like France and, and a few others, um, but many of them were city states up until very recently. I mean, Germany was formed in the 19th century by Bismarck. Italy, also in the 19th century. The former colonies in Africa are these cobbled together sta states, for the most part, those nation states. Same with a lot of, um, of South America, the very recent nation states. And my thinking, along with some other people, is that the nation state really depends on an industrial civilization that's able to move people long distances really cheaply, um, mass communication. And there's a political scientist at Yale named James Scott who um, has studied the state. He studied anarchic societies, uh, which is interesting coming from a tenured professor at Yale. But he really. points out that up until very recently, up until really World War II, states could not actually govern out of the valleys. They could only reach flatland. It was too expensive to get up into the hills. So hills all over the world have been where the wild people live, where the ungoverned areas have been until quite recently. A really interesting fact, so a part of that limit was until fossil fuels, um, it, it was very difficult to tax very far because urban areas generally paid their taxes in money, but rural areas up until pretty recently paid their taxes in grain. And it turns out that 100 miles is about as far as an ox cart full of grain can run before the ox eats all the grain in the cart. So that's the effective power radius of most states, is one ox cart's ride, essentially. <laughs> so that was really the effective range of states until fossil fuels and rapid transportation and building freeways everywhere and all of that. So the state, I mean, the, you, you know the interstate highway system is actually called the, what is it, the National Defense Interstate System? Because yeah. it was really built um, by Eisenhower, who had a terrible experience of World War II trying to run Allied forces for Europe. <clears throat> Transportation was this big issue. Those little windy roads in France and Germany were just horrible to work with. So he wanted to be able to move stuff fast in big ways. So building the interstate was his idea, a way of solving the idea of moving convoys really quickly over large areas. So Blitzkrieg could be popular, uh, you know, easily done in the interstate system. Uh, I digress. And what I mean to say <laughs> is that, so the effective range of the state has generally been very small an interesting factoid to permaculturists is that valley people tend to use grain, and that is easily measured and easily taxed, because you can tell, you know, an acre of grain, an acre of wheat's going to yield this much, we're going to tax you that much. Hill people tend to grow tubers as their staple crop. Very hard to tell what a tuber yield is going to be. Very hard to tell what those tubers are, because they're in a polyculture. And tubers are not really economical to transport long distance. So polyculture as opposed to a monoculture. So you have a bunch of different tubers all growing together and, and with other plants as well um, that all support one another. That's the difference. Distances. So that is another element of freedom uh, for these stateless people is growing polycultures and, and not having a grain-based culture. So my thinking is that as energy descent continues, we will see a return to something more like the city-state pattern as nation-states become untenable. So here's this central core of some kind of city, big or small, and fed and surrounded by and, and nourished by and nourishing the rural area around it. Um, but after all this, after all this talk about cities, I just want to share you know, my vision and I think a lot of your vision. Um, also, just to, to wrap up, 
is just to toss out this whole idea. If I were doing ultimate permaculture on the planet and actually designing uh, the conditions for really uh, happy, happy environment, happy people, healthy ecology, I would do something more like a horticultural village society, not based on agriculture at all, but based on horticulture, which is really what is at the heart of permaculture. It's a horticultural based system rather than agriculture. It's plant culture rather than field culture. Um, lots and lots of villages, lots and lots of land that people inhabit, but they inhabit because it helps support them. So that's kind of kind of my vision. Um, all right, that's going to wrap it up. And <laughs> I am teaching a couple of permaculture design And of course, uh, he's not teaching those anymore, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, uh, just kind of to, to kind of wrap that up. As we, as we saw there at the end with, with a lot of those examples of, of, of uh, different permaculture courses and the projects that have come out with them, um, it fits really well with a lot of leftist ideas of like mutual aid. These, these permaculture projects can serve as hubs for things to give the resources to your local community that you need without going through some, you know, bureaucratic nonprofit, without relying on any necessarily formalized government agency to do it. By coming together and, and using what resources we have available to us in our local communities, we can use permaculture to start solving some of the problems um, or at least getting a lot closer to solving some of the problems that uh, people are being left behind uh, for. Um, things like food insecurity, things like uh, housing insecurity. Um, permaculture can really add a lot of depth and a and, uh, wide array of tools to any sort of leftist project. So that's why I like to include it in, in the, the theory that I cover. Uh, but I think that's going to do it for tonight's video. I'll just uh, one more time give you a peek at my channel where I keep all of my archives. So if you're interested to see more of the stuff that I've done, um, I, I like to organize things into playlists. Uh, so I usually go through books, uh, audiobooks on, on leftist thinkers. I have the principles of communism that I've gotten through. A couple by David Graeber recently. I did Are You an Anarchist? And... Um, on the theory of, uh, or on the phenomenon of bullshit jobs, which is a really interesting one. Uh, let's see. I have ones on, on this, this permaculture series that, that I've linked in the chat a couple of times. I'll link it one more time. Um, just so you can have that as another resource you can take a look at. And we'll put that in the chat one more time. So that is tonight's playlist that we're, we're working our way through week by week. Um, I've done some stuff with lo-fi theory, combining lectures of, of like um, uh, uh, Michael Brooks, and, and uh, I think I did the Communist Manifesto and set it to lo-fi music. Uh, and then I did uh, the Conquest of Bread and the Communist Manifesto, and now we're working on State and Revolution, although I haven't gotten to those, I haven't gotten to putting those videos out. But uh, it turns out that tomorrow, I'm a landscaper, and uh, it turns out tomorrow I may be rained out, so I may be having a, a good chunk of time to start getting caught up on my videos so we get closer to where we're at in the Twitch stream. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, tonight's content. I hope it's given you some ideas to, to think about and, and apply to your own uh, praxis or, or whatever it is you're, you're thinking about or, or trying to do. I think permaculture has a, a lot to offer. There's one more thing I want to highlight um, let's just find the, uh, group that I manage on, I, I manage a couple groups on Facebook, one of those being Left Signal Boost, and coming up, we're going to be doing our second annual Lefties Award show. It's, it's, it's an informal thing. Um, it's all nominees and, and, uh, content nominated by just whoever decides to show up and be a part of it. Um, and it's just, we, we have a, a uh, database of, of various leftist groups. Um, I can put that in the chat in a minute here too. Uh, so, you know, take your platform, Twitch, YouTube, whatever. You just have a whole archive of, of uh, or a whole listing, a directory of people that, that do that sort of content from a leftist point of view. Um, and 
this will be our second year doing this uh, this silly little award show. But basically, we're going to start our nomination process as soon as October rolls around here. Uh, so come on over to Left Signal Boost on Facebook, and you can be part of the, the nominating process. You can nominate people in whatever category you like, as many people as you like, um, just people that have done great stuff in the last year. We usually do two categories per, per uh, platform, so we'll have best YouTube video and best overall YouTuber of the last year. Uh, but it can be more categories than that, you know. If you if you had another category you'd like to throw out once the nomination gets underway, then then feel free to do so. And then we'll have a vote. We'll have a vote up on just a basic uh, Google. Um, what do you call it? Google survey. So it, it'll be open to absolutely anyone to to vote for their favorite leftist content creators of of various types. Um, and then we'll have an award show uh, the day after Thanksgiving. Um, here on this channel on, on bread theory and uh yeah it'll be a lot of fun and you know it's 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 definitely not super formal or whatever but we just thought you know since movies and 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 tv and all these other these forms get so much tension uh with all the award shows they do why not do an award show ourselves and have it be you know literally from the people um and uh, just highlight some of the best stuff that's come out in the last year. And that, that's really what it's for. Just a, another way to highlight great leftist content creators across many different platforms. So, yeah, come, come be a part of uh, Left Signal Boost um, as well as we're also going to be doing it in Left Pod Posting. If you're definitely into uh, leftist podcasts, that's another group that I, I do that will also be part of this process um, of nominating so yeah come check it out um and otherwise on this upcoming wednesday i will be doing state and revolution on this channel with the for we are many podcast i'll be doing chapter four i think we're up to chapter four already in state and revolution uh learning a lot of great things uh, going through that book it's not one that i had read before so really uh, excited to see what other stuff we get into in in the coming chapters so if you like leftist theory come join us for that